Welcome to tonight's Committee on Finance for April 19th. Uh, as you can see, Councilors, we have quite an agenda tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody to stick to the uh, order of the agenda. Uh, we will be starting with two public hearings. Uh, try to keep your questions on point and let's avoid redundancy. Uh, we want to be home sometime around midnight tonight. So, uh, At this point, uh, Madam Clerk, would you read item number one? Public hearing. Order that the City Council of the City of Brockton finds that there is a clear need for an urban renewal plan in order to achieve the approved policy or objectives in downtown Brockton. That the City Council approves the boundaries of the downtown urban revitalization plan as depicted in Map 1-A, Boundaries and Topography, invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Robert Jenkins, Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, Michael Gallarini, Executive Director of the Brockton Century 21st Corp, Angus Jennings, AICP, AG Hennings, LLC, Steve Kearney, Stantex Urban Places Group, Claire O'Neill, VP Planning and Development, Mass Development, Jim Walsh, Mass Development, Ian Jacobs, Mass Development, and John Markovitz, Mass Development. Okay, first of all, uh, somebody out there, I didn't give my usual warning, please put your cell phones on. On vibrate, please. Uh, Councillors, just so you know, all of those names I don't expect to hear from unless you have a particular uh, comment for them. Time having arrived, I declare the hearing open. And at this point, I'd like Mr. May to come up and give us a presentation on this, uh, what will become an order on item number four. Moving to vibrate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, my name is Rob May. I'm Director of Planning and Economic Development uh, for those watching at home. And uh, we're joined by uh, Shane O'Brien, who's our staff planner here. Uh, we have a brief PowerPoint presentation that covers both topics of, of the two hearings for tonight. Um, many of you are aware that over the last couple of months, we've been working on a downtown action strategy. If you could advance to the next slide, Shane. Um, our overview of what we're, uh, we're talking about tonight is just an overview of the planning process. The, um, the projects that have been identified in the strategic action, uh, the action strategy for downtown, and how those then get um, translated into the downtown urban renewal district and the DIF program. And then we'll end up with some time for some questions. Uh, we have been, oh, I'm sorry. I have copies that we'll pass, of the slides that we'll pass out to you. Uh, we've been working in this process for about nine months now. Uh, we were identified uh, by Mass Development as a um, transformative development initiative community. They were able to match some funds that uh, we had from our 40R dividend that we've reinvested in the city, and we've come up with an action strategy. We've been... Next slide. Um, Thank you. The uh, area that we've studied... Uh, is outlined here. Um, uh, we're calling the two areas the, a, a DIF area and then an urban revitalization plan, URP area. So the DIF strategy area is an area that was established by council last year, uh, which really sets the base of uh, assessment for um, being able to be captured back into the community. Um, but it is also the boundary of the larger study area. The urban renewal district is a very small targeted area within that boundary um, focusing around the uh, MBTA train station and moving um, out onto Frederick Douglass and Legion Parkway in the area around City Hall. We've had a series of stakeholder meetings over the last uh, nine months. Dozens of interviews, dozens of focus groups, surveys online where we got uh, a couple hundred survey responses. Uh, a lot of the counselors have uh, also been involved in some of the public meetings that we've had, and we appreciate your um, response to that. Um, as a result, we've come up with the downtown action strategy, um, which was distributed to you uh, in your council packets. Huge document, great reading, put you to sleep. Uh, no, actually it is a, a, a very well thought out program of things that we can accomplish um, if we work together over the next few years. It does also identify some very quick hit activities that we can do right away to make downtown a better place. Um, two of those items are adopting an urban renewal district and adopting the 40, uh, excuse me, the uh, 40Q uh, DIF. District Improvement Financing Program. Um, we also talk about um, 
uh, bringing in and creating a, a downtown managers program that's going to help implement the programs. And many of you may have seen in the newspaper, we've been identified uh, for a TDI fellow by Mass Development. So we're going to have a person who's on Mass Development staff working with us for the next three years exclusively on downtown activity. Um, we uh, want to work on the um, restaurant incubator, which is an important project. Uh, we were able to secure a uh, state, one of the state's urban agenda grants uh, for that, and I'll be coming back to you in uh, probably another week, uh, or month, excuse me, to have you accept that grant proposal. Um, there's some zoning improvements that we need to make. Um, we've reconstituted the homelessness task force. We want to create a um, arts and culture task force, arts, culture, and entertainment. We want to work on a clean and green program, creating some downtown ambassadors. We want to make sure that the streets are, are clean and that people feel safe out on the street with uh, uh, roaming patrols. And then um, uh, lastly, or, or not lastly, but uh, we want to change the zoning ordinance to allow for um, outdoor dining and um, outdoor entertainment. So those are things that are, are currently missing from our zoning ordinance. The plan focuses, uh, you, you really have to start at the train station. And many of you have heard me say that Center Street between Montello and Main Street is the most important street in the city because it connects Main Street with the T station. Uh, there's a lot of activity that's already happening in that area. We want to build on that success and keep that moving forward. Uh, there's also a nice, strong note of opportunity around Frederick Douglass Way, um, where there's some city-owned properties and uh, where we think that we can really kick off something um, quite spectacular in a, in a restaurant incubator and uh, a small arts building. Uh, other areas of downtown have secondary priority. That doesn't mean that we've forgotten about them. They, are ha they do have activities that are, that are planned in there, but you know, the, our biggest bang for the buck is going to be concentrating on the area between Maine and Montello, Center, and um, uh, Court Street. We also want to uh, focus in on strategic infill. There's, there's what we call the missing teeth in our smile. So there's some vacant lots that we want to take care of. There's um, first floor commercial uses that are sitting uh, uh, um, vacant that we want to refill. Um, it all is uh, part of building a walkable downtown environment. Um, if you want to go next. Um, the plan also identifies that our work is not done yet. There are other areas in the district that need further planning. We want to create master plans for the area around the CSX tracks, north side of downtown, you know, north of Pleasant, north of Court, uh, south side of, of downtown, you know, from Crescent, Crescent South, um, the area around the, uh, the two courthouses, and also at the far end of uh, Legion Parkway, where Legion and Warren come together. There's some great opportunities to knit that community into the downtown and take care of a couple of blighted problems that we all know about. Um, over the next few years um, in our urban rene uh, renewal plan, we've identified a series of moves that we would like to make with council support um, to acquire some properties um, to or uh, otherwise make projects happen. Those include acquiring land that is in between uh, Montello and the train tracks currently, Avon Auto, the old D'Angelo's, Dunkin' Donuts, we feel that it's important for us to create an urban environment there, but in order to make that happen, we need to move some pieces around on the, on the chessboard. And so in order to allow some city-owned property that's currently surface parking lot that's moderately um, utilized, we want to create a, a new temporary surface parking lot to allow those par car parkers to move into that space so that we will be able to then take the former city parking lots and make them available for redevelopment. Um, likewise, uh, we're going to work very closely with the owner of uh, 93 Center Street, the furniture building. They have a proposal in right now for historic um, tax credits to allow that to be used for um, residential redevelopment. 
Um, and so those are, you know, activities that these projects are supporting. As those projects advance, we plan on seeing the uh, Trinity go into their phase two of their project, which means building the new parking garage and another 130, or excuse me, 103 residential units uh, on their site. Forward. Um, at that point, when we have the parking garage downtown, which you know is going to be large enough to support all the development that we see coming around in this in this neighborhood, we'll then flip the uh, temporary surface parking lot into residential and mixed-use development that's going to be adjacent to the train tracks. And finally, in 10 years and beyond, oh, uh, and we've also identified a spot, I'm sorry, that um, is uh, a great opportunity for a pharmacy uh, as an amenity for downtown. Uh, that's on the, uh, at, cor at the corner of Court and North Montello. Uh, there's currently a vacant lot right there and, a, and an abandoned bu a vacant building that's not being utilized for much. We think that that's a great opportunity. Um, we need to work with uh, the real estate market to confirm that. Um, and then finally, uh, as, as many of you know, we're working on a uh, master facilities plan. Uh, it probably will um, call for the redevelopment of, uh, of a new public safety complex, uh, certainly a new police station. Uh, because of, of, of the um, uh, decrepitude of the station. Um, and then that would allow us to redevelop those parcels around the train track. So the action strategy creates the vision of what we want to do as a community and, how, and, and where we're going to go. The urban renewal district is the authority to actually carry out that plan. We have several downtown master plans over the last 20 years that have some great pictures, but then sit on a desk somewhere because there's no real authority to carry that out. The urban renewal plan will give that authority to BRA. Robert is here. Wave, Robert. There he is. I'm sorry. Um, as uh, executive director of the Redevelopment Authority, their board will have the power to acquire properties, to finance reconstruction, to um, make deals happen in, in downtown. That's something that has been missing from all of the downtown plans that we've had in the past. <coughs> um, the plan that you see that's in front of you right now um, has a series of recommendations in it. It does have a financial plan uh, associated with it. It's supported by the DIF program, uh, the District Improvement Financing. It's supported by um, state and uh, you know, grants, funds, or, or projected revenue from things like Mass Works, um, from 40R, um, extra 40R dividends from, from the Smart Growth Project, and from other um, uh, Massachusetts grant uh, authorities. It also um, uh, uh, will require um, a vote of this council. The urban renewal plan has also been um, recommended for adoption by the planning board, which is a uh, requirement of mass law, and by the Citizens Advisory Committee, which made a recommendation to the, urban, uh, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority board, and the board has also endorsed the plan, which is why it's in front of you today. The DIF district now, so, so we have the vision, we have the authority, the DIF is going to provide us with some of the financing that we're going to need to make this happen. So DIF um, was established last fall by this council, which allows us to capture incremental revenue that's generated from new growth. So the growth is being um, plowed back into the community. We're, we're, we're not living off the dividends like a trust fund baby. We are taking these dividends and we're reinvesting it in our community. So those funds, go to the next page, will allow us to acquire property, we'll pay debt service, we'll um, work on streetscape, um, repaving roads, improving um, the underground utilities as, as we come across these projects. Um, and it'll also allow us to work towards the goal of creating a two-way transportation program back in, in Brockton. Um, 
So to, to summarize, basically we're, we're in front of you with three documents, items um, one, two, and four on your agenda. Um, item four, the downtown action strategy, is the vision. Item one is the authority. Item two is the financial resources to carry out this plan. Uh, I should point out to you that what we have here is basically a blueprint of where we want to go. Each year, we are going to have to come back to council for your authority to spend those dollars. Um, we will be making a recommendation to you, but it's your vote that says what BRA and the city can do with those funds. So ultimately, the authority still rests with this body, and um, it, it's, it's part of our strategy to keep you informed um, and keep you involved in creating a stronger downtown. So with that, I'll end the presentation, and Chairman. Uh, thank you. Questions. Council, this is the public hearing aspect of the night, so when these come before us as an order on numbers three and four, we'll have a chance to question. At this point, uh, uh, any uh, pub member of the public that would like to, uh, to comment on the plan, step forward and give your name to the uh, clerk. And at this point, it is a separate public hearing, but if you have questions on any of the uh, items that uh, Mr. Major spoke about, you certainly can come forward. Good evening. You can Mr. say your name for the record. My name is Philip Griffin, I'm a resident of Brockton and a board member of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Uh, after we did a thorough analysis uh, with the Brockton Planning Department, uh, the economic development, um, went through a thorough process, and in order to improve and address the conditions of vacant properties uh, with declining property values, we really have to change the structure of the way we do things. Uh, we ask that the City Council approve the boundaries of the Downtown Urban Re Revitalization Plan as depicted in Map 1. We ask that the Brockton City Council approve the Downtown Brockton District Improvement Financing Program pursuant to Chapter 40Q of the Mass General Laws. And we ask that the Brockton City Council approve the designation of Brockton as a gateway community city and approve the implementation of the Housing Development Incentive Program to encourage the development of market rate housing through, tax ta through state tax credits to qualified development projects. And finally, we ask the City Council to adopt the Downtown Action Strategy as a principal policy and a roadmap for the revitalization of our downtown. Thank you, Councilors. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward and make a comment? Seeing none, I'm going to call, uh, close that hearing. Uh, we'll now uh, start public hearing number two. Madam Clerk, if you could read the, uh, the order, please. Public hearing order that the City Council of the City of Rockton, acting pursuant to Chapter 40Q of the Massachusetts General Laws, hereby approves the Downtown Brockton District Improvement Financing Program, the Program and de Development Program pursuant to Chapter 40Q of the Massachusetts General Laws, appending the order approved in 2015, establishing the Downtown Brockton District. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Robert Jenkins, Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, Michael Gallerini, Executive Director of the Brockton Century 21st Corp, Angus Jennings, AICP, AG, AG Jennings, LLC, Steve Kearney, St Stantex Urban Places Group, Claire O'Neill, VP Planning and Development, Mass Development, Jim Walsh, Mass Development, Ian Jenkins, Mass Development, and John Markovitz, Mass Development. Thank you. Uh, I declare the hearing open. Is there anyone who would like to come up and make a comment? Uh, again, this is technically a separate public hearing, but it's essentially on the, uh, the information that we just heard. Uh, is there anyone who would like to come up and make a public comment on that? And just for the people at home to understand, uh, because this uh, involves federal money, federal monies possibly, and some state monies, this has to uh, have had a public hearing. And uh, I seeing none, I declare that hearing closed. Thank you for keeping your presentation fairly brief. <laughs> uh, now we'll move on to order, the first order of the night, item number three. Madam Clerk, if you could read that, please. Order that the City of Brockton has been designated as a gateway community by the Commonwealth 
and that the Commonwealth has implemented the Housing Development Incentive Program, HDIP, to encourage the development of market rate housing in the gateway communities through the state tax credits to qualified development projects. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Jim Walsh, Mass Development, Ian Jenkins, Mass Development, and John Markovitz, Mass Development. Council, this is an order uh, for us to accept. Uh, Mr. May, I believe uh, with Mass Housing has uh, some information for us before we uh, entertain any questions. Um, with your permission, um, I know that you received um, some maps in your packet. I do have um, available adult size that I can see across the room, um, which shows our current HDIP district, which is in blue, Housing Development Incentive Program. The proposed expansion is in the north. Um, and a little bit um, off, the, uh, off of Warren Avenue. The reason that we're proposing this change is that we want it to align with the proposed expansion of the 40R Smart Growth District, which is going to be in front of uh, the Ordinance Committee on uh, May 2nd. Correct? Correct. Fourth. Fourth? I think it's the fourth, is it? May Whatever. The first the meeting second. in May. Second? Okay. Second. I hope I'm there. What was, what was the second? No, I don't want to say it in front of the mic. We'll check that. It'll be posted. I believe it's May 2nd. Uh, May 2nd. So the reason why we're asking for an expansion in the 40R district is to line up with the proposed changes of the 40R Smart Growth District. So we're asking that the current district be expanded a little bit to the north um, along the uh, Main Street and Montello corridors, North Main Street and North Montello corridors, and to include the area around Perkins Park. Um, Perkins Park area is probably not what a lot of us would consider prime real estate at this point in time, but it is very close to the train stations, close to our downtown plan, and we think that by creating this investment incentive around the district, and this is again a tax credit from the state for market rate property, not affordable market rate. It's, where else would you get that? Um, so we think that by creating the uh, district around Perkins Park, allowing for smart growth development in that area, we may be able to attract a couple of developers and start the revitalization of that neighborhood, which is in desperate need of, of, of a makeover. Um, and still support our downtown action strategy and the goals that we have for building a better uh, community in our downtown. Okay, Council Morning, any file us? Do you have any questions? Is that, no. Oh, did, uh, as far as, oh, okay, so you're talking about the uh, ordinance meeting? On this. Uh, no, the ordinance meeting, we'll let them know. But. Okay. Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. May, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight and thank you for your presentation and all the hard work you're doing and all those that are in attendance. Uh, as you know, this council has always supported uh, Chapter 40R uh, smart growth uh, development. I mean, it was the catalyst for development and we, we ratified that many years ago. Um, I guess my question, and I, and I pause and I have concern relative to talking about a lot of residential uh, downtown properties and the impact it would have on our school systems. And I know uh, previously, and if you could give me a little leeway, Mr. Chair, when we were talking about agenda item number one, you were talking about, and I think it's long overdue, a, a new police station, but I didn't hear anything about new schools. And I know during tough economic times, every penny counts, but I, I, I'm fearful, and I know, you know, I serve citywide. I know I've heard this from a lot of people, and, and, and Shana and Moses and Wynn have also articulated this as well. W we can talk about this, but what, but what is, in your opinion, in your professional opinion, what is the detrimental impact, if any, uh, on our school systems and how do we somehow um, buffer that? Well, um, I, I think the easy way to look at it is, is the trend that we see nationwide of people wanting to live in downtown urban districts. What we're seeing, uh, the demographics of, that we're seeing in those districts tend to be people who are fresh out of school, just starting their professional careers. Councillor Lally. Um, or uh, empty nesters who are looking to um, divest of, of a lot of their, um, uh, what they've collected over the years. And so they're looking to downsize. Those are the two people who, two groups of people who are really looking in down, into downtown. The other nice thing about this 
is because it's in a 40R smart growth district, and, and again, I, I thank you for your leadership in, in getting that originally passed. What 40R comes with is also 40S um, in, in Massachusetts General Law 40S, which states that because we're giving um, a density bonus and allowing residential development in this district, if the incremental taxes that are generated from this new residential development that you have downtown or in this district are insufficient to cover the costs of educating the students that are coming from that development, then the state kicks in, makes up the difference uh, under a, a, a formula that uh, it, it's very difficult to explain in one sentence, but there is a, a formula uh, for that. So right now, um, every 40R project, and we have um, three in our downtown district, uh, we have some homes on Green Street that were built uh, back in 2006, if my memory is correct. Um, we have the uh, station lofts, and we have the um, Trinity um, Enterprise Block development. Each year we produce a report to the, to the Commonwealth that details how many children are in that area. Um, we get assessor's information, uh, and that goes to the state to determine whether we need to, or whether we're creating sufficient taxes to support those children. Um, right now, um, the number of school-aged children in those projects is, is really minimal, um, almost non-existent. I think it's under five, if I can... We think it's under five. Um, so should future development occur in downtown, uh, we don't think that uh, if, if we continue to follow the national trends, we're going to be getting people who are, are less family-oriented uh, because that's the kind of person that's moving into a downtown area. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, sir. Thank you. Councilor Lally. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just one quick question. Do you think that there are, I, I know in the, in the past in Brockton we've had a lot of, you know, a very, a very business-centered downtown. Do you think we'll still be able to sort of strike a balance between a center of, uh, cent, you know, a center of the city in a business sense and in a, in a home, in a community sense? I, I think we will. Um, it, it's obviously something has got to lead, something has got to be first. There is not a strong demand for office space in this city, in, in, in really in anything south of um, 128. Uh, you're not seeing new, a lot of new office development. At some point in time, that is going to change, and we will see more office expansion down here, like we have seen with, with W.B. Mason. Um, they're a tremendous asset, and we want to continue to work with them as they expand uh, and in future expansions. But in order to support the first floor retail that we have, currently have, in our downtown district and create a walkable downtown environment, we're going to need to add residences within a quarter mile of that district. So our strategy is based on the current market trends and what we're seeing nationally and regionally to lead with housing. Um, there's an adage in the real estate business that retail follows rooftops. Um, we need to increase the quality of housing downtown in order to be able to attract the kind of retailers that we want on our first floors. Thank you. That's it. Councilor Farwell. Uh, good evening, Mr. May. Uh, evening, thank sir. you for a, a quality presentation. Uh, I just have a procedural question for you. Would you say that the adoption or the expansion of 40R is probably more important or this should be predicated upon that because that's not a given. Obviously it will be debated in ordinance and then it will come before the council, but do you think it's appropriate to do this tonight if we do not adopt the ordinance change to expand 40R? They do go hand in hand with each other. Um, if we did approve the HDIP and 40R were not amended, um, the, um, the, num uh, the density that's required to create new development 
would not occur in that district. And it, it would create a situation where we would not get developers' applications for that district. It's not that we would be penalized for it. Uh, it's just that it, it, it would be a tool that would be unused. I, I guess my response to that is that, uh, and I'll get into it more when we get into the order on the urban revitalization plan, I guess my response is that as I've read this, and I, and I literally have spent about 30 hours going through it page by page, and just the scuttlebutt I pick up from the other councilors, I think they've done the same thing. It just seems to be an over-reliance on housing as the end-all to the issues that plague the downtown. And that if we jam enough people downtown, then suddenly we're going to have the most vibrant city that you could possibly imagine. And I'll, I'll tell you my concern with 40R, and it, some of it came up at a, at a ZBA meeting. 40R says that a developer, as a matter of right, can put up residential units. Now, financially, it's interesting. If you put up something commercial, it's $32 per thousand valuation, the city takes in quite a bit of tax revenue. With housing, it's only about $17 and change per thousand. That's my first issue. But my second issue is that if you look at the downtown area, we almost have a government center, medical center type of setup. We have the courthouse, we have the school department, we have city hall, we have the unemployment office. We're soon to have an expanded district attorney's office with, with extra personnel coming in. Uh, we have the neighborhood health center, a very vibrant center, which because the population is aging, I suspect there will be a demand for more and more services. And, and I'm not saying I'm against this. I guess I'm troubled by the fact that we already have a nucleus of something going on here. And you mentioned no one really wants to come out beyond 128 for office space. I actually had a conversation with a developer uh, last week, last Friday as a matter of fact, and he said given the cost per square foot of office space in the Boston area, why doesn't the city try to capture some of that, go to insurance companies, do some outreach, go to law firms and say, look, we're right on the tee. You can get into Boston in a matter of minutes, and this is what we have for amenities. This is what we might be able to do for you because we do have some parcels that the city owns. I'm thinking of the old uh, Robinson Appliance Store at the corner of Green and Main Street. Um, and I guess those are my concerns, at least with respect to this. Uh, and I do think procedurally it would be much better to find out are we going forward with more 40R or aren't we? And um, I mentioned the Zoning Board of Appeals. There was an attorney who had a project coming before the ZBA mm -hmm. and he wanted to turn some, uh, a commercial building into residential. And the attorney flatly turned to me and said, you know, if this were in the 40R district, we wouldn't even have to be here. And it was good that they were there because Chief Galligan, who is uh, retired Chief Galligan, who was chair of the ZBA, pointed out some fairly serious public safety issues that probably would never have been discussed. We could do site design and we can do, uh, we can do design and, and site review if someone wants to put up residences, but if they just bypass the ZBA, that level of, of detail that comes out, that oversight, I think you sometimes lose. Uh, I, I do want to uh, address that about the 40R, um, and you know, is it by right? Well, yes, there there is. 40R allows for residential use by right. That's the whole purpose of the program. It does not preclude us also from uh, trying to attract large-scale commercial development should it be happening. Uh, when the market is right for that, we certainly will be um, uh, looking at that. Um, Will 40R development get the same amount of scrutiny as our ZBA? I would say that our 40R gets a better scrutiny than the ZBA because the developers in question under 40R have to put together a rather extensive dossier of materials that are reviewed by an outside consultant, peer-reviewed, and then are approved by the Commonwealth before they can become 40R our, our projects. So, um, you know, whether it be traffic, um, lighting, massing on the street, all of those things are addressed in the 40R application and are reviewed by an independent consultant that is paid for by the 
um, developer, but um, hired by the city and have to be approved by the Commonwealth. Um, internally, building permits, uh, they still have to apply to the same building permit standards uh, as everybody else uh, in the city. So um, while the um, proponent's attorney did make this case of I wouldn't have to be here, um, it does not mean that they will not get a level of scrutiny. And it, it's quite frankly a, a higher level of, of scrutiny than uh, a regular ZBA case. Well, let me just read to you what concerns me, and this is right from General Laws Chapter 40R, and this is Section 6, and I'll just read subsections 5 and 6. A proposed district shall permit infill housing on existing vacant lots and shall allow the provision of additional housing units in existing buildings consistent with neighborhood building and use patterns, building codes, and fire and safety codes. A proposed smart growth zoning district shall not be subject to limitation of the issuance of building permits for residential uses or a local moratorium on the issue of such permits. Now, again, you and I aren't attorneys. I did exchange email with you. I also exchanged an email with a state official from DCHD. And if you drop a smart growth overlay district over a given area of the city, whether it's industrial, commercial, whatever it may be, and a developer comes in and buys a building, that person, as a matter of right, can go down to City Hall and pull a building permit to turn that into residential use. As and long as they are meeting our standards. As long as they are meeting our standards. I, I agree. But that really takes any level of control over how much housing, in what area, what effect in the schools, does it trigger a new bus that's required, are the public safety issues, is the green space there so that someone will have some modicum of, of quality of life. And, and that's really, and I'll end after this, that's I guess a philosophical issue with me. I don't want to attract people into an area and then give them really nothing, at least at the outset, that contributes to their quality of life. Adequate parking, a, a pharmacy, um, that green space. Which, which is why we have these all, all three, or all four being packaged together. I, I agree. Um, but it's uh, important. I, I do want to, one last point. Um, in, in real estate, in, in commercial development, when we're looking at um, uh, supporting the retail that's on the first floor, you generally need 1,500 residential units within a quarter mile to support 50,000 square feet of, of commercial space, of, of retail restaurant space on the first floor. Downtown Brockton currently has over 300,000 square feet of first floor retail space. We don't have nearly enough residents to support that population, which is why we see a lot of vacant and underutilized um, uh, first floor commercial right now. We need to build up our, our population as neighborhoods in Cambridge, Boston, Lowell, um, other gateway communities have done, Chelsea, uh, in order to support commercial development downtown. Okay, I guess my last comment is, and I, I don't know if it's in the strategy document or in the urban revitalization plan, but I think there's a statement in there that says at the time of this report, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority has not identified any potential tenants to occupy any spaces downtown. Do we have any anchor tenants who have said, if you build it, we'll come? If you put 1,500 to 3,000 more people downtown, CVS will come in. We're just waiting for you to do that. Do we have anything tangible to hang on to as we, as we go through this level of review? What we do have is um, the, now the tools that are going to allow us to attract development of that size. Before that, we would not be able to acquire and assemble the parcels that we need to make that happen. We wouldn't have the funding to um, convert downtown to two-way traffic. We wouldn't have the residential uh, density uh, to make uh, those projects feasible. So it's because of these three plans together, working together, that we're going to be able to market our downtown, to bring new developers downtown, and to make those things happen. Okay, I, I guess my question was, have we had any discussions with any anchor tenants or any pharmacy that indicated to the city, if you increase the density of your housing to a certain level in the downtown area, 
we'll locate a CVS, we'll locate a, a Rite Aid, we'll, we'll come into the city and do that. I know these are the tools to get it done, but is there any level of commitment from anyone that if we increase that density, they're going to come downtown? We have had conversations with the development community. They are telling us that we need to have these tools in place in order to make that happen. Do we have somebody signed for the corner of, of Maine and, and Green at, at the moment? No, we don't. Do we have some ideas of who we should be talking to? Yes, we do. But without the tools to make that happen, and to improve Main Street, to improve, um, to invest in that building, um, we're not going to be able to, to make that happen. And so these go hand in hand with, um, this, these are the tools in the toolbox. Once we have that, we then have a large downtown marketing strategy that, that we need to roll out. And the plans that we have in front of you have been vetted by development professionals so that they are supportable by uh, the number of units that we're talking and the amount of square footage that we're talking here. But um, once we have control of these properties, we'll be able to work with the Redevelopment Authority to market those properties to very specific tenants. Well, again, my apologies to my colleagues. You, you've brought, enough, brought up another element that concerns me, and that is I don't know what the fiscal year 2017 budget is going to be. We have $3.3 million in reserves. It really should be $7 million. I'd like to have about 2% of the annual fiscal year's budget as an emergency fund. Uh, I don't know what layoffs are going to occur in the school department. I don't know what layoffs are going to occur in any other departments. We have unmet capital expenditures, uh, capital improvements that are needed. And I don't know if I'm ready to say I'm going to turn all these buildings over and allow them to be sold and not have that money come into the general fund so that it could be appropriated for other uses other than economic development. I mean, I, I'm sitting here and I'm feeling uncomfortable that there are so many unknowns. And even in the urban revitalization plan, there are a lot of TBDs, to be determined, to be determined. And I, I hope you can appreciate how uncomfortable you feel as a public official struggling to try to make the right decision, but not feeling as though you have all of the information that you need because of the unknowns that I just mentioned. I, I think the unknowns are a big worry for everyone. And but without having a plan and a strategy to address the unknown, to, to address the issues that we do know, that our streets need to be rebuilt, that um, we need to convert to two-way traffic, that we need to take down some decrepit buildings or cause their redevelopment, without those plans, um, I think we would be even in a more uncomfortable situation because at this point we're, we would be wandering in the dark. Now, you're right, we don't know what's going to happen in 2020, which is why we come back each and every year to you with a um, projection of, of what increment is going to be available, and then it's up to you to decide how that gets spent, how much of it goes into redevelopment, how much of it goes into the general fund. And of the money that goes into the redevelopment, where is it going to be spent on? So every year you have a check and balance um, of process. Well, the, the other thing we don't know is that approximately nine <coughs> days from now there's going to be a decision about a casino. Whether you are for the casino or whether you are against it, I don't think any reasonable person could argue that that won't be a transformative decision for the city. If we get the casino, I'm going to find it hard to believe that the whole commercial area and the whole interest of the city isn't going to gravitate west to Belmont Street. Belmont Street really has been the new Main Street for about 20 years. If we don't get the casino, financially, quite frankly, the city is going to be in, in more serious shape than it is now. So that's the other unknown coming in nine days, which really could have a significant material effect on, on downtown development because it, it's, that's a huge project. And uh, uh, with that, I, I thank my councilors for their indulgence, and I, I thank you. Thank uh, you, sir. May. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Rianieri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, sir. <laughs> and thank you for your presentation, and thank you and your staff for all the hard work that you've been doing over the last several months to uh, put this uh, whole plan in, in, in place. 
And uh, I'm not going to repeat some of the same comments that have been mentioned by my two colleagues at, at large um, because I totally agree with um, some of the things or all of the things that, that have been mentioned, uh, especially some of the comments that uh, may, uh, Councilor at large Fowl said I almost called him Mayor Fowl, and I'm sorry about that. The but, old days. Uh, the old days. That, that's what happens. There's some of us old guys around still. That's the problem. Um, but in any case, um, I have great concerns with uh, some of the same things that, uh, that he has mentioned. And, um, you know, with that being said, um, and I think he said it very, uh, very diplomatically as well, I think the, the biggest concern that we all have is the fact that we're going into a very, very tough budget year. I don't think just going into the next year, I think the following year as well. And, and I think you're also going to see a, a return of, of some difference to what you've seen during the recession over the last few months of, of things going a little bit backwards instead of forward. But uh, that, as we may, we have to deal with each and every single, um, single day. Uh, just a couple of things that I just want to uh, pick up on because um, when you're talking about the Montello Street area and you're talking about those pieces of property and D'Angelo's and Dunkin' Donuts and taking the uh, auto place, the Avon Auto, and, and uh, a couple other places there, um, and, and the police station uh, being as, as one as well, I, I would probably, and, and I say this just as my own way of looking at it, and I would think some other councils would think the same way, and I know the people in the public think the same way too, is if we're going to do something for a police station, well, let me put it this way, if I'm going to put a smile on the chief of police face, then I want to put one on the fire chief's face as well, because I think what we, we need and we're well overdue in having in this city is a public safety building yes. brought up to the standards of what it is about today as we're fighting our crime, our men and women, and as our men and women are also fighting fires, new apparatus, new equipment, both ways, everything that, that's needed to make sure that they're doing their job the way that, that it has to be done, um, and, and I think that's what's, in my mind, most important that should be first done if we're going to do anything and get any types of monies, is that should be one thing that we should be looking at. I know if I was a sitting mayor, that would be my top one priority. First of all, public safety, a new building for them to work out of, and a, and a new building that this city drastically, drastically needs, because I think it's well, well overdue. The other issue that I have that... that um, comes up a lot of times um, even when I have my ward meetings and uh, discussion is, is brought about you know downtown uh, people always mention about two-way traffic is there a chance for that to be again and I didn't hear where that was even mentioned at all if I oh that's a high priority sir okay it, for two-way traffic for two-way traffic you sure yes okay because I've only been here for that for the last 33 years so I just want to make sure that we're on the same page well, it, it, if, if I may we, we have started the process by filing a um, project needs form, PNF, with the Commonwealth. Um, we um, have um, also gotten permission from them to uh, develop a model of our downtown, uh, electronic model, uh, that is going to look at how traffic flows through downtown through different configurations of, of one-way street pairs and converting that over to two-way traffic. Okay. Now, we do know that there has been a line item in Governor Patrick's um, bond authority uh, to help us convert to downtown. Um, under the current administration, I so would not want to hold my breath. So, okay. However, our downtown action strategy, our urban renewal plan, our DIF plan, contemplates this um, and is projecting to do to redo a couple of streets each year to get us to the point where we can go back and we have all new traffic signals all of our lanes have been lined up properly mm -hmm. so all we have to do in that last year is go back restripe and write a little bit of computer programming so that all the traffic signals talk to each other and everything is geographically in place so we're, we're moving in that direction, uh, albeit, you know, it's not as fast as I would like it, but it, it, it's a $6 million project, but and that money is just not going to materialize. Right, right, and, and, and we knew it always was that, that, that price tag that it did have was the $6 million. Now, you're, for, you're not sure whether the line item is going to maintain itself through the, the Baker administration. Is that what you're saying, through his budget? Or? Um, while the line item is there, okay. it, it is the governor's prerogative to... Um, identify projects. Now, we, we need to do our homework, and that's get in a project information form, PIF, 
uh, that'll get us a project number and get us on the TIP, which is the Transportation Improvement okay. Plan. Okay. That is a, available for state and federal funding. Right. Um, it would be, if it were put on the TIP now, um, there's several projects regionally that are ahead of us mm -hmm. um, in order to get that. So it, it's a long, it's a long haul. Um, I think that having the DIF in place and funding our share of those federal dollars, that's going to be very important. We're going to have whatever the amount is, we're going to have to provide some money to it. DIF is going to give us that right. money to provide. Okay. I just hope that um, because right now I haven't seen where the governor is being too positive in some of our projects and I don't want to say anything further to that, but I mean, it has me concerned to the fact that, you know, will we be positive if we're trying to do something like this? That's where, again, and I, and I don't like to, not being rude about it, but that's why we have our state people, and I hope that we're able to have them work with us. And I know they'll work with us to get it done, because we do, as far as I'm concerned, in order for anything to work, you need two-way traffic downtown and Main Street. Mm -hmm. And I've been saying it for many, many, many years, as well as other people have been saying it. If you want it to work and to work the correct way, that's what you're going to need. You're never going to have Main Street the way that it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Those days are gone. I mean, you know, we're, we, we know this change, and, and we, we accept that. But um, that's my, that, that, to me, is very, very important. And, and um, you know, I realize that, you know, there's other streets that need to be rebuilt. And, and I, I want us to be careful when we do mention streets from him being rebuilt, because then it ends up the neighborhood start calling and saying, when's my street going to be rebuilt? And we're not going to be doing that. That's another issue for another day. But yes, sir. I just want to be careful because if we listen to the neighborhoods I have to listen to. And, and they're right. They're taxpayers, and we don't get to the neighborhood streets like we should. But um, those are some of the things that I have uh, with concerns. And, uh, again, I mean, uh, a lot of residential coming in. Um, I know you're looking at it to age brackets and what the people in the age brackets are doing differently, just the same way I do when I sell a car. Something new comes out, I can judge who's going to be in that model, maybe. But sometimes I'm not right. But um, that alone, if it doesn't, then I, I too have the concern about, you know, schools and, and what we're going to be doing there. So uh, I, I'm... I'm I'm very concerned about the whole the whole plan. Um, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's it's something that's overdue. But I have my concerns as, as well. So I mean, I weigh out some of the other comments and concerns that my other colleagues have. But I, I just want to made it known and uh, appreciate it, everything Thank you're you, doing. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Councilor Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Rob May, for coming this evening and doing such a fabulous presentation. I've been watching this whole, you know, um, how would I say, organization. Um, throughout the summer and the fall, and there's so many positives within it. But I, too, am somewhat concerned about certain entities of it. And again, this is not to, you know, how would I say, continue to focus this on you, because this is not all you're doing. But um, having been to the ZBA meeting the other evening and seeing the, uh, what used to be standard modern and the presentation that took place to make that into residential, there were so many concerns, and the way it was done, and of course, certainly the attorney's comment on we wouldn't have to be up here if uh, this was 40R, really made me nervous because there were questions about parking, there were questions about safety, um, whether people could evacuate the building in a fire with enough warning, and also, I'm excited about having a lot of market value residents downtown, individuals that are going to spend their hard-earned money in our community. And this is where I feel that there's a little bit of a disconnect. And this is what I was hoping that maybe you could elaborate on a little bit more. Um, it, it's our um, philosophy, and it's stated very clearly in our, our action strategy, that, that we are looking to increase the... Uh, mix of housing in downtown. Um, currently, uh, we have an overabundance of affordable housing downtown. We need to balance that with market rate housing. The 40R and the HDIP Housing Development Incentive Program allow us to attract more market rate housing in, in our community. Um, and, and that's important, you know, it's important with us. It's also important with um, Secretary Ash at DHCD, or um, Housing and Economic Development. Um, it, it's, it's critical 
to creating a livable community in, um, in gateway communities. And we've seen the success that's happened in Chelsea and in Lowell and in other gateway communities. Uh, we see that kind of growth going on. Um, he champions that kind of activity, and, and we kind of we echo that that sentiment also. Okay, thank you. You all set, Councillor? Yes. Uh, anyone else before I get to Councillor Lally who's going to go again? Anybody else? Councillor Lally. Hey, sorry, uh, sorry about that, but I, I thought of something else. Oh, no problem. Um, I remember hearing that, and I, I believe it was Lowell, had a allied health center, you know, the, uh, the campus, like part of a, uh, a local community college. Mm -hmm. They had it brought into their downtown, and it had a noticeable, very positive effect in helping to revitalize and turn around the downtown. In your opinion, do you think that a similar sort of deal, I know Massasoit is working towards getting their own would you, uh, in your opinion, would you feel something like that would be good for the downtown area? Um, just for the record, it's, it's the city of Lawrence. Lawrence, that I'm, has sorry. That. I'm it's, sorry. It's the <coughs> Eastern or Northern Essex Community College um, who has a, a couple of buildings in downtown Lawrence. Um, the first one started out as a general office building, but just recently um, through the, the state's um, capital <laughs> plan for... Um, uh, development, uh, they were able to secure funding from the Commonwealth for a um, allied health science building, uh, which I toured um, with the mayor and a couple of other people. Absolutely incredible, incredible building. Um, but it's right in the heart of their downtown. It connects with um, a, a lot of street activity in the area. Um, I think something like that would be, and, and we continue to support either, either the, the uh, Allied Health Science Building downtown, which, which we think would be a, a, a real easy win. Uh, we still support and need to work with the Commonwealth on creating the um, downtown higher education collaborative. When you look at the population in Brockton, especially within a quarter mile of downtown, and the skills that they bring to the table if we're going to compete in the 21st century. It, I mean, this is already 2016. People are passing us by. We need to get um, our residents properly trained, involved in adult basic education, associate's degrees, and in the right kinds of skills um, to compete. Thank you. I believe I believe. So the answer was yes. It, yeah. it is important. And I, I believe theirs was... For the, the main campus was much further away, too, much 12, 13 away. miles instead of one mile. So yes. Certainly, certainly would have some benefit in Brock. I, I, I think so. All right, thank you. My thank you. Thing. Council Moynihan. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for your presentation, Mr. May. Um, I think you've heard and I think you've answered most of my colleagues' concerns as far as I'm concerned. Um, you put together a very good comprehensive plan for the downtown. As you've said, we've had many plans over the years. We've just looked at them. It looks nice. We've had a few things happen, but nothing has really happened. Um, this plan can put your plan, basically, into place, into motion. And that's what we have to do in the downtown. We can hem and haw. We can bitch and moan. We can complain about everything. But unless we get something in motion, it's going to be stagnant downtown. We have, a few, we have a few buildings. We have the Trinity downtown. We have some good stuff happening. But unless we move forward, nothing else is going to happen. It's going to stay status quo for the next 10 years. So with that, I'm going to make a motion for a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion is made and second on a favorable recommendation. On the motion, Councilor Farwell. On, on the motion, just to my colleague from Ward 2 and to Mr. May and, and anyone else, I don't think any of us are opposed to developing the downtown. I think we're a little bit concerned about the scope and scale of the project. I'd be much more comfortable with some reduction in proposed housing and perhaps a two to three year plan and then at the end of the two to three years step back and do a full evaluation of did we do what we intended to do, did we get the intended results, have we bettered the downtown area, were we able to afford what we wanted to do, what was planned in the document and then come back and do stage two. 
as opposed to adopting a 10 or 20 year plan. Um, so I hear my colleague, I don't disagree with him, but given where the city is now at this point with all of the unknowns, uh, I, I just feel uncomfortable about charging ahead with this. Motion been made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, put your hands up, please. Uh, motion carries. Recommended favorably to the full city council. Madam Clerk, read item number four, please. Order that the city council of the city of Brockton adopts the downtown action strategy as the principal policy roadmap for revitalizing downtown. Invited Robert May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Robert Jenkins, Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Michael Gallarini, Executive Director of Brockton Century 21st Corp. Angus Jennings, AICP AG Jennings LLC. Steve Kearney, Stantex Urban Place, Places Group. Claire O'Neill, VP Planning and Development, Mass Development. Councilors, if you have any questions on this, let's make sure they're new questions. Anyone? Entertain a motion. Uh, Councilor, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. May a quick question. Absolutely. If I could. Uh, Mr. May, uh, I too appreciate the, uh, the presentation, and I'm actually, um, I mean, that, that picture looks very beautiful. Um, and I wish that that actually would become a reality. But what, what frightens the daylights out of me is that as someone who's lived in the city for quite some time, and I've seen this, this show quite often, to be honest with you, um, I'm just going to ask you point blank because um, a, lot of the, a lot of the taxpayers in this community, uh, they hear a lot of, uh, I don't want to call it dog and pony show, but basically that's what it is in mm -hmm. some instances where people come in and make all sorts of presentation and there's pictures and there's uh, renditions all over the place and yet uh, what ends up happening, you'll, you'll end up with a hole in the ground like we have at 121 Main Street. Um, so that being said, um, do you have a list or a set of priorities? Let's say once you get out of here today, tomorrow you're going to get out and say, the first person I'm going to call is this, the first project we're going to take on is this. Because I, I think a lot of times when you, um, what ends up happening is that, you know, we see a lot of these so-called projects. Uh, and I remember I was with the, uh, with the Harrington administration back some years ago, and we had a, uh, a traffic study done in downtown. Spent thousands and thousands of dollars on, of, funds to do those traf the, the traffic studies, but to be honest with you, uh, we are now eight years later talking about uh, whether or not we're going to advocate for two-way traffic in downtown Brockton again. So my question is, again, concretely, exactly what are we going to do tomorrow you know, once you get the okay to go, well, actually not tomorrow because you wait until the next council meeting in order to do that. So on Tuesday of next week, once this thing gets approved in the council, what are you going to do in terms of saying I'm going to take on project number one to move forward with this stuff? And then two, why is it that we cannot go back and revisit some of the projects that we actually had already spent some tax, you know, taxpayer dollars on that and move those forward instead of kind of waiting and see uh, what happens with the, uh, the, the projects that you currently have? Okay. Um, in, in this slide and on, on this um, presentation board, we, we identify what we're calling the very first quick first steps. And that includes um, the, the urban renewal plan. Um, it includes bringing on a downtown fellow who has been brought to us by mass development. Uh, this person is going to spend 100% of their time implementing this strategy. They're not going to be get distracted on zoning cases. They're not going to get distracted on, um, you know, green space in, you know, I think personal board four or uh, uh, other activities. It's, it's just what is in this strategy. So we'll have a full-time dedicated person to do that. The second issue that we should, I want to reiterate, is that each year we're going to come back to you with a strategy a work plan for that year, what we want to accomplish, and what we think it's going to take to accomplish that. Uh, so uh, it, it is broken up into, uh, the overall plan is broken up into three phases, 
but each year we're going to be coming back to you with a, a list of what we want to do. A lot of the plans that we have seen in the past have been and are incorporated in this document. So we haven't reinvented the wheel. I want to make that clear. The work that has been done in the past is very good work. We didn't have the tools to implement that work. We didn't have the funding to implement that work. And more importantly, we didn't have the staff, the personnel, the team with mass development, with the fellow to implement that work. And so we, we have those people and, and, and systems um, in place now. Um, the action strategy really melds those plans together, creates a vision, a unified vision, but more importantly, if you see at the end of the action strategy, it lists an entire uh, project by project what needs to be done that's come up out of the planning process, who's responsible for it, and when should it be done. Um, that we come back to you every year to say what we've accomplished, what we need, and, and how we move forward with it. It also allows us to work with extra uh, new partners uh, to bring into downtown, to work with the current businesses that we have here, the current neighborhood organizations, our partners um, at OCPC, to advance the projects um, that are moving forward. You, you had mentioned the, the transportation plan. Um, that model was done eight years ago, I believe. It's out of date. It needs to be uh, updated. And the program that it was written in doesn't exist anymore. So it, it, I, I'm sad to say we, we have to recreate that, but we have to recreate that with the future of Brockton in mind, not what Brockton was eight years ago. So where we're looking for development, we need to know do we have the right road width, the right turning radius, um, the right parking counts uh, to support the development downtown not uh, eight years ago, it, it, it was just basically looking at moving cars through downtown uh, as quickly as possible. We're trying to create an environment where cars want to and should pull over, park, <coughs> come to dinner, shop, live, play, um, and, and that requires a different type of, of downtown uh, traffic strategy. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is that most of us in this city uh, agree that downtown isn't going to, we, we've tried just about everything in downtown. Um, I've been here for 30 something years and I've heard, you know, strategies after strategies to try to bring downtown back once uh, the, the mall came in and the businesses went away from downtown. But one of the things that we all agree on is the fact that downtown needs to be two way. So why is it that we cannot get all our resources together, all our heads together, all our advocacy together, and make that one project a reality? Instead of, because to be honest with you, the average taxpayer in this community, uh, I said this to Mr. Condon, I think he took offense to it, couldn't care less what our bond rating is. What they want to see is, is there a place I can go to eat with my, my wife, husband or whatever? Is there a place I can go? You know, businesses that are tangible, something that you can touch and see. And, that, and that's what people are mostly interested in. And, and believe it or not, aesthetics makes a big, uh, a big difference in people's uh, point of view. So those all look beautiful, to be honest with you. But in reality, is it's not, you can't touch it. You know, it's, uh, it's plans, it's strategies, it's development, it's things that you're looking to do. But it's not, you know, I can't go home and say, well, you know, the reason why that, that backhoe in the street is there is because downtown two-way traffic is coming back, you see. So why is it that we cannot, all of us together, basically, <coughs> since we're saying that we have agreed that this downtown is going to go perhaps the way of two-way traffic, why can't we all get together and get that done? That's a very good question. And uh, I think as we finish off our planning uh, uh, of the transportation model, the, the project need information um, PNF form uh, that, that is due um, to MassDOT, we'll have an idea of what it's actually going to cost us to convert downtown. It's not a matter of just changing the, the stoplights out. Um, all of those need to be replaced. They need to communicate with each other. Um, the road 
um, intersections all need to be realigned with each other to make sure that we have the proper turning lanes, turning radiuses, on-street parking, off-street parking. Uh, it's going to take a, a sizable chunk of money. I don't know what that amount is right now. It's in excess of $6 million. Um, if, if we had $6 million lying around, we could do that project a lot quicker. I understand that. but what I, before that. I understand that. Well, what I'm saying is that I think one of the things that there's a lot of us on this council that don't honestly believe that the, the powers to be in the city are actually behind that two-way traffic in downtown. Because if, if it was, then it would become a reality. When the studies were done, I mean, the, you, you did say that the studies were done back in 2008. There were, in 2008, there were actual studies and ready-to-go studies uh, with, with schematics and all that other stuff. So if it was fine back then and the powers to be kind of agree that the project was a project doable to do, then perhaps maybe in 10 and 12, those things could have realized. And now it's gone, we've gone eight years it basically passing the project by where it requires another study. My fear is that we would be back here again in 2020 talking about the same thing. That's the fear that I have. I mean, we're, we're, we're putting together these nice schematics and it looks nice and it looks beautiful for presentations, but the fear that we all have is that why is it that we cannot take small chunks and go with the small chunks at the time where we can actually say to the taxpayers in this community, look, we've done this project, we've all agreed that downtown two-way traffic is a project that's doable and we've done this and we can slowly move forward and go, and go ahead with the projects. I think that this plan is a series of small chunks. This is a series of steps to be taken over multiple years. <coughs> you know, you, you see the end result in, in, a, in a fancy drawing and it looks wonderful, but there is a step one to get to, you, to get to that point. And those are the things that our team is going to be working on from day one. Once we get the, the fellow started here, um, we'll have 100% of, of that person's time committed to executing this plan. Well, I, I hope so. I hope so because uh, I'm telling you, some of us are getting old and a little long around the tooth and I don't think we're going to be around for another 30 years to put up with this, you know, so I hope that it does move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speak for yourself, Councillor Rodriguez. Speaking for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Razak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. May, quick question. Yes, you, you've mentioned uh, the TDI fellow a few times. Has someone been hired, and if so, are they a Brockton resident? Um, the TDI um, fellow is an employee of Mass Development. Um, that fellow is um, uh, George Durante. Yeah. He's a former Mass Dot employee, uh, or excuse me, an OMBD, Office of Business Development. Um, because he works for mass development, he does not have the same residency requirements um, as a city employee would, and so that person is not a resident of Brockton. Okay, thank you. It wasn't just for residency. I just was hoping it was somebody that was familiar with the city and had a little bit of uh, history. Um, his relationship with, at OMBD, um, he is very familiar with our downtown area. He's been our case manager for all our mass works grants. Um, so he's been involved in Trinity, he's been involved in um, a lot of the uh, road projects that you've seen downtown, including, you know, Center, uh, Center Avenue, excuse me, Commercial Avenue, um, the um, Center Street resurfacing, which is going to be coming back to you in a, in a couple of weeks, um, the, the railroad viaduct lighting projects. Um, so he's been involved in all of those activities, and so he is very familiar with Brockton. Thank you. Thank you. Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. May, you, um, quick question. You'd mentioned a few times um, that on an annual basis you'll be reporting back to the council. Could you really clarify what that means? Is it mere, merely an annual report, an update, projections, progress, and looking forward, success rate? I mean, what, what, what teeth does it really have? While we do have an annual report that is due to the board and, and excuse me, the council and to the citizenry of Brockton, we need to, in the budgetary process, come to you each year and say, this is what was done, 
This is how much money the DIF has generated. These are the programs that we think you should spend next year's DIF allocation on. And it's your vote that decides what our next steps are going to be. So what's the ramifications if, if and again, I, I concur with Councillor Rodriguez, a lot of us aren't going to be around here. I mean, Jack might be the only one here in a few <laughs> years. Um, but, and I mean that in a good way, Jack. But, but I, guess, I guess my thought is, I mean, let's just say it's, it's, it's a, a line item that, that we don't fund. All right, we, we strike it. Um, and, and what's the ramifications if this is adopted? Because this is projected out so many years down the line. What's, what's worst case scenario if you could explain it before we do a ratification vote? Mm -hmm. If you have to do A before you do B, no. and we choose not to fund A, B then gets pushed back another year or two. And is there any detrimental impact from the state to the city? As a result There's of no that? detrimental impact to the state. Financial. How, however, I should point out that once we get into a bonding situation, should we decide to bond to acquire or to, to make downtown two-way traffic, um, once we're into a bonding situation, the, the bonding um, underwriters will require that there's at least enough money in the DIF and the sinking fund to cover the, the bond payments, any debt service that's, that's required. Okay. But in terms of like uh, when we did 40R, there was a drop dead date and it was a reimbursement clause that the city was going to have to pay back to Massachusetts if there wasn't shovel ready by X date. So in terms of, uh, of any payback, there's nothing there. It would only impact a potential bond. It, it would only uh, affect a potential bond. There is a specific term limit yep. to the urban renewal district, which is 20 years. Um, we're also we're projecting the diff to be a 30-year diff, so we're only allowed to collect money for those 30 years. So every project that we push off later into that 30-year period, the less opportunity there is to recoup those costs. So there is an opportunity cost to us, but it's not as if the state is going to call back money. Okay. And in terms of the DIF project projected out, is there any type of uh, uh, barring, you know, we, we, we use TIFs all the time here in, in Brockton to, mm -hmm. to a beneficial light, but, but is there any, can you still grant a TIF in a DIF project? Is there any, any type of uh, there's, barring? There's no prohibition of that. However, with one caveat, um, if you get into a bonding situation, you wouldn't want to create a lot of new TIFs because that's going to affect the amount of money from the DIF that would be available. At that point in time, though, having a DIF in a TIF, excuse me, having a TIF in a DIF, um, you're, you're really moving money from one pocket to another, and, it, and it, it's not beneficial to have them together unless it's for a project that is <coughs> of such merit that it's, it would support um, uh, going forward on. So okay. it, you would weigh each one on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, I got you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council uh, uh, Monahan. Yes, again, thank you, uh, Mr. May, for all your uh, patience up here tonight answering the, our, co our colleagues' uh, questions and concerns. And um, I'd like to make a motion for a favorable recommendation. Actually, Second. I'm going to ask you to hold your motion. I know there's more questions. Oh, I thought you said it was. Uh, yeah, I last. thought it was done. Councilman no, Farwell. No, no question. I can speak on the motion. Okay. Motion been made. Did I hear a second? Second. Yeah. Yeah. Motion made and seconded to recommend to the favor favorably to the full city council. Councilor Fowell on the motion. Yeah, on the motion, just to my colleagues and to those here tonight, I'm, I'm going to vote against this, and I do so reluctantly. I do believe we need more housing density downtown. I do believe we certainly need urban revitalization downtown. I do not agree with certain provisions in this urban revitalization plan. One of them is to turn the central fire station when we have a new alleged public safety uh, complex over to development for commercial and residential. That building is in the National Register of Historic Places, and I believe it was one of the first fire stations in America that had electricity. I don't agree with another provision on page 81, where we're going to acquire 27 existing properties, and there's a comment in here, environmental assessments will be undertaken upon acquisition of the properties by the BRA. I don't know of anyone who would acquire property 
and not know if there were environmental concerns. You might very well take possession of a piece of property that would cost you millions to clean up, depending upon what's under that surface of the land or what that building was used for. I don't agree with bulldozing 7 Commercial Street, which is the current police station, if there is a new one, down so that we can put more residents and more commercial use into that area. If anything, I would think the city might want to consider using that as an adjunct to City Hall at some point in the future or an adjunct for some other city department. So there are specific reasons. I wish it were a scaled-down report. I wish, as Councillor Rodriguez mentioned, it was something where we could measure our effectiveness on a relatively short-term basis and then move on from there. But absent that, I, I am unable to support it. Thank you. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Recommended favorably to the full city council. Councilors, we're going to take a literally two-minute uh, <coughs> recess so that uh, Mr. May can get rid of all this stuff. You, Don't go anywhere because it's going to be two minutes. Can't wait to uh, organize it, but back in session. Yeah. Madam Clerk, read item number five, please. Shoot. Appointment. Okay. Mark Spicer of Brockton as a member of the Conservation Commission for a three year term ending in January 2019. Mr. Spicer yeah. is replacing Craig Peener, who resigned from the Conservation Commission. I invited Mark Spicer. Good evening, Mr. Is it Spicer or Spicer? Spicer. Spicer. <laughs> Any questions? Make a favorable recommendation back to full Second. city council. Second. Second. Council Beauregard. Yes, I'm sorry. Hello. Thank you, Mr. <sighs> Chair. Uh, good evening. Yes, I was wondering, um, you didn't have, they didn't give you us a letter here. They gave us your um, resume. Correct. And this is really great that um, you're um, an individual with um, extensive background in electricity. But I was curious what your background was in conservation or the environment. Well, wor working as an electrician and stuff, I deal in lots of places we have to deal with you know, conservation and, and you know, city uh, and town ordinances and stuff. So I believe the way I've dealt with the codes and the electrical for the last 35 years, I'm pretty sure I can deal with the committee and, and make uh, the best recommendations for the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Motion been made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommend favorably. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your time. Item number six. <coughs> Appointment. Brenda Perez is a member of the Ver Diversity Commission for a three-year term ending in April 2019. Invited Brenda Perez. Good evening, Ms. Perez. Good evening. Sergeant. Sergeant. <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> Any questions? Move favorable recommendation. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you very much, Sergeant, for your service. 
Item number seven, uh, and I entertain a motion to take seven and eight together. Second. Motion, taken. Yes. Second. motion made and seconded to take items number seven and eight together. Madam Clerk, would you read item seven and eight, please? Order in compliance with the provisions of the election laws, notice is hereby given that the state primary will be held on Thursday, September 8, 2016. Invited John McGarry, Executive Director of Elections. Order in compliance with the provisions of the election laws, notice is hereby given that the state election will be held on Tuesday, November 8, 2016. Invited John McGarry, Executive Director, Elections. <coughs> Uh, Councilors, just to let you know, Mr. McGeary was here earlier tonight. He was feeling a little under the weather, so I advised him to go home. These are pretty much pro forma. Make a favorable recommendation. Second. Back to the Council. Motion made and seconded to recommend items 7 and 8 favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? Opposed? Items are approved. Item number 9. Order appropriation of $4,000 from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Public Health Fiscal Year 2016 Mass Decontamination Unit Grant to the Brockton Fire Department Fiscal Year 2016 Mass Decontamination Unit Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, and Chief Financial Officer Michael F. Williams, Fire Chief. Move Good favorable. Chief. Second. Move Good. favorable recommendations. <coughs> Second. Motion made and seconded for full, uh, recommend favorably to the full <laughs> City Council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably full city council. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you, council. Item number 10. Order appropriation $20,000 authorized under Chapter 46 of the Acts of 2015, Section 2, Item 1599 through 0026 from the Department of Revenue for Local Services on behalf of the Executive <sighs> Office for Administration and Finance Development of Formal Financial Policies Grant to the Brockton Finance Department Development of Formal Financial Policies Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Evening, Council. This is a grant that the city applied for. It will be run through my office. It comes from uh, the Secretary of Administration and Finance's office through the Department of Revenue, and the purpose of it is to develop a formal set of financial policies for the city that we'd bring back to the City Council for its review and, and sign off. No match. No match. Favorable recommendation. Second. Again. Motion made and seconded. Recommend favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? All those opposed, recommended favorably. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Might as well stay right there. Item number 11. Order appropriation of $46,600 from the fiscal year 16 Senator Charles E. Shannon CSI Local Action Research Partner Grant to the Brockton Police Department fiscal year 16 Senator Charles E. Shannon CS CSI Local Action Research Partner Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Police Chief. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. This is a grant award to the City of Brockton to contract uh, out to Kelly Research Associates of Norwell, Mass, who conducts an annual evaluation of our city's Shannon grant. Um, requirement of the grant is to have a local action research, research partner to, re to evaluate the grant. Thank you. Motion Move for favorable. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, Chief. Item number 12. Order appropriation of 75000 from the Executive Office of Public <coughs> Safety and Security, EOPS Highway Safety Division, Fiscal Year 16 Sustained Enforcement Step Grant to the Brockton Police Department Fiscal Year 16 Sustained Enforcement Step Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Police Chief. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. <laughs> this grant funds will be used to pay for the police overtime, conduct high visibility traffic enforcement in pre-identified intersections substantiated by local data, including high volume of accidents and injuries. Thank you. Chief, might I, might I ask you a question? Yes. Can we get our people to enforce people who block intersections? You can't get across from the east side to the west side of the city as it is. They block intersections constantly. I know it says certain intersections. Right. If that can be done, it would be a big help, in particular with us older drivers. We can make that part of this. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Councilor. Motion for a favorable recommendation. Oh. On the motion. On the motion, Councilor Barnes. Um, I know that there are some signs that don't, well, they don't say don't block the box, but there are some signs don't block the intersection that have gone up recently in certain areas. Is, is this going to cover that as well? Alarm. For like signs for, through traffic? It won't cover any signage. It's just going to cover enforcement. Okay, so just. Uh, Councilor, I think there's a misunderstanding. Okay. You mean there are signs that are, have been put up? Yes, I, I yes, this won't put new signs up, but I think she wants to know if this will cover the enforcement of those. Yes. 
No, it's going to cover new signs, right? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if it, was, if it were going to cover some of the new signs because I know traffic. Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. That the signs have come through. I assume they, they've come through traffic. Come some through of them traffic. have already come up. But, no um, but I didn't know if this was going to encompass that as well. No. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank, thank you, you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, item number 13. Order a transfer of 200000 from the Law Department Ordinary Maintenance to the Law Department Workers' Compensation. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, and Chief, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nasrella, Solicitor, and Mary Milligan, Workers' Compensation Agent. Good evening, Good evening. Attorney Nasrella. Members of the Council, due to the unexpected rise in medical attendance for primarily police and fire, we've been uh, uh, compelled to come before you for, a, for this increase. Um, any questions? Councilor Farwell. Just a quick question, uh, Mr. Attorney Nesrala. Given the amount of money, are, are these cases going to be resolved? Are they heading towards retirement? Do you see this costing the city more money or as much as you can tell us not violating privacy? Well, some of them are. I, I don't have a uh, percentage. Some of them are. Some of them are not. Uh, most of these are uh, the primary costs have been for surgeries that have been incurred as in, the course of, in the course of their duties. But they range from everything uh, A to B from uh, A to Z, emergency room treatment, uh, ambulance, x-ray, et cetera, et cetera, all the way into surgeries and, and post-surgical care. Thank you. Recommend, uh, motion? Motion recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Item number 14. Order a transfer of 4500 from Finance Department Personal Services full-time salaries to Traffic Commission Public Safety uh, Ordinary Maintenance Services to fund an engineering study for the intersection of Forest Ave and Bouvet Ave. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Robert DeBerry, Captain, and Patricia Floria Law Office. Good evening, Mr. Evening, Councilors. Uh, there was a request made uh, from the Traffic Commission to perform this engineering study at this intersection. Uh, I think the deputy can give you more information on that. The funding source is coming from my office. I had a budget uh, for hiring of a junior analyst in the office. The position wasn't filled until later in the fiscal year from what we anticipated, and that's the source of the financing for the request. Thank you. The motion questions? recommend favorably. Second. Second. Uh, on the motion, I would like to hear from the deputy chief. Deputy Gallagher. What the purpose is. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, the intersection of Forest Ave and Bouvet is a 1950s vintage design. Uh, we find that it's uh, unsafe for the pedestrian buttons to be in use, so we have discontinued the use of the pedestrian buttons. As a result, that uh, intersection needs to be okay. redesigned. So what we're taking here is the very first step to identify what oh, the scope of it. work would be to find out how much of the intersection would need to be redesigned okay. to bring this up to modern standards we would provide a safe passing for pedestrians using a signalized push button and allow them to cross the streets. It's currently uh, been discontinued on my order because I found it to be unsafe for both the pedestrians and the motorists to have that 1950s vintage design in use. Okay, and when you say 1950s vintage, so vintage design, like the me. numbers are... <laughs> Yes. Uh, so uh, you're, you're very familiar with these, I'm sure. We have uh, five of these intersections in the city, and that's when the red and yellow light are on at the same time. Oh, okay. So yes. when the red and yellow light is on at the same time, the only way to make that happen is to bypass a safety that prevents that from happening. So those designs are no longer acceptable under current traffic signal standards. Okay. So this is the first I intersection that I've identified. Uh, and recommended to the Traffic Commission, and they've agreed that we need to start without this work. So this is our first intersection out of five that we're looking at. Okay, and um, is this also going to be in collaboration with OCPC and, and the transportation? Yeah, folks luckily there? OCPC just did a study through that corridor and identified that intersection as one of the primary intersections that needs to be addressed. Okay. So again, that kind of backs up uh, the Traffic Commission's desire to have that intersection looked at. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Rodriguez. Deputy Chief. Councillor. Uh, as a member of the, uh, of the uh, Traffic Commission, uh, I'm just going to ask you point blank. What are you, I know this $4,500 is basically to cover the study. Yes. So uh, where are we going to get the money to pay for the, uh, the so, work that needs uh, to be done? We've, we've decided because we have no budget for this in the Traffic Commission, and I'm, I'm here as a representative of the Traffic Commission, but I also am responsible for the maintenance <coughs> of the traffic signals. The... Uh, 
this is just the very first step. We really don't know as a traffic commission what the scope of work is going to be. <coughs> so once we have this scope of work done, CDM Smith, the design engineer, will be able to provide to us how big a project this is going to be. Uh, this has also been identified in other studies of uh, significance of the city that this intersection does need to be looked at. So to answer your question briefly, it's just the first step in understanding how big a problem is this. How much do you think it's going to cost? I have no idea. Uh, Something that's why of we its size. Have, I've, um, yeah, I've, I've been in this job for about three years maintaining the traffic signals, and this is the first intersection that we've looked at that we say we want to upgrade the intersection. So I'm not sure I can't give you a good answer. All right. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Rezac. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deputy Chief, I'm um, also serving on the Traffic uh, Commission. This is, once you do this study, this can be applied towards some of the other um, some of the other lights that... Yes, so what we're hoping is, is as soon as we get this study back and we find out what the scope is and what the cost is of this one intersection, then we'll have a great understanding of what it's going to be to take care of those other intersections. Now, the other thing is this is a city intersection being at uh, Forest Avenue Bouvet. The other intersections, one of them is on Montello Street, Route 28. So maybe we can pressure the state into up updating that intersection. So there are other ways to maybe look at some of these other intersections, but we'll have a better understanding of what we're up against once we've gone through the process with this one intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ranieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, just my fellow colleagues, uh, as you may know, may not know, Forest Avenue, Bouvet Avenue is uh, uh, Ward 3 and Ward 2. So um, I'm pleased to see that we're finally going to do a study here so that we can uh, hopefully rectify a problem that we've had there over the years. We just had a problem there the last six, seven months ago. I think we had, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had a problem, a situation that occurred there, um, which was a safety issue um, that, that I think brought it even to the attention of the, of the mayor's office, and he wanted to do something to, to get something done here as well. We had to make a temporary correction, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think at, at that point, um, just to answer some of the questions uh, that my colleagues have, especially those that are on the Traffic Commission, which I was on last year as, as, as well, I think that if uh, it comes back at a, at a reasonable price, or no matter what price, I think we're going to try to do whatever we can <coughs> to get money into the traffic um, budget so that we can make sure that it gets, um, it gets corrected, because it needs to be done. But in the same token, it can also go in, in, in junction with what we're trying to do even on Forest Avenue in itself, um, because it is a main stretch and it, um, it's definitely a public safety uh, matter there. But uh, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do as the Ward Council, and I'm sure my colleague from Ward 2 will do the same, because it's, uh, it, it's definitely a public safety matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let's a motion. We had it. Oh, we already had one? <laughs> you guys talked so long, I forgot. <laughs> Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to the full city council. Yeah. Those traffic Thank you, people. Deputy Gallagher. Item number 15. Resolved that Mr. Stephen Bernard, Brockton resident in Brockton, NAACP no. official, appear before the city council's finance committee to inform and update the members relative to ongoing efforts within our community pertaining to prostate cancer awareness, education, and associated testing practices and procedures. Invited Stephen Bernard. Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Councilor Sullivan. Uh, Councilors, I, I filed this resolve uh, after I had a conversation with Mr. Bernard, actually at the train station downtown. And, um, you know, he brought to my, my attention and my education the significant percentage, higher percentage of this terrible disease among black men. And, um, and again, we all know people that have been impacted by this disease. We know really quality men that have, that have lost their lives because of this disease. So I know there's um, uh, people here tonight uh, that can educate us. Um, and I, I, I know that Mr. Bernard is my invited guest, but there's other people here as well. So let's give some leniency because I think it's a very, very important issue. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Thank you, um, Council Sullivan. Evening, Council. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, give you an update on our initiative of uh, bringing prostate cancer awareness, uh, education, and, and screening uh, to Brockton. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, the first part of the presentation, we're going to give you a little background or update on what we've been doing over the last several months. And then I'm going to ask uh, Janet Trask uh, and uh, Steve Abrams, two members of, of the NAACP Health Committee, to come forward and talk about uh, uh, prostate cancer facts, risks, and, and screening. And then we'll come back to me and talk about what the importance uh, this is to uh, citizens of, uh, of Brockton. And finally, uh, to ask uh, for, your, for your help. So let me begin. Again, thank you very much. There is a partnership in Brockton here between the Brockton area NAACP, 
Good Samaritan Medical Center, and AdmeTech Foundation. A profile of the lead organization, which is AdmeTech Foundation. AdmeTech Foundation, that's A, small d, capital M, small e, capital T, E, C, H. Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization leading the battle against prostate cancer through the advancement of early detection and treatment. Established in 1997, our mission uh, is, to, is to end prostate cancer as a patient care crisis and social economic problem. Mm -hmm. The focus, our groundbreaking awareness, education, and advocacy programs expedite development of the manograms, precision, broad-based diagnostic tools, including but not limited to biomarkers, genetics, genomics, and imaging for individualized precision care. Our research programs are uniquely dedicated to the creation of life-saving imaging for men, which will end the era of blind patient care and, and create the future of pre, uh, precisely targeted, minimally invasive diagnosis, biopsies, and treatment. A review of the organizations and people that we have been talking to over the last several months include a presentation by Dr. Faina Stern, who is the CEO and president of AdmeTech, coming to Brockton to address concerned citizens about uh, the uh, epidemic of prostate cancer. And that was held at Lincoln Congregational Church. There are about 20 people, all who have enrolled into the NAACP to, to continue to advocate uh, for this effort. We also decided to plan to have an event in conjunction with the Martin Luther King Breakfast, which was held on January 16th. Included in that uh, planning were the uh, administration of a Good Samaritan Medical Center. And from Good Samaritan Medical Center, uh, Jack Cabral, community, of health, uh, a community health worker, is here uh, to represent them. And I believe you are sitting... Right here. Thank you. Thank you for coming, for me coming tonight, uh, Jack. We also did a presentation after our, our seminar on January 16th with the Brockton Hospital. We've, then we did an, uh, a presentation before uh, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Uh, we have been meeting and having uh, telephone conferences on a biweekly basis, and have, we have been training a group of uh, people who will go out to speak to other social service organizations and healthcare providers. It is our goal, in fact, uh, to encourage other healthcare providers to be uh, partners uh, in this effort. On, on March 31st, just a week or so ago, we participated in the eighth annual Prostate Cancer Awareness Day held on Massachusetts State, uh, at the Massachusetts State House. We were also delighted to have and we continue to have the support of our state delegation. Senator Michael Brady, Representative Cronin, Representative Dubois, Representative Cassidy uh, uh, were also present. So we have Brady, Cassidy, and Dubois. I think we have all of them in there here tonight to, to show their support, to show our support. Thank you very much for coming tonight. It is also important that we, we tell you that our state delegation is working very hard to advocate for a, a budget request for full year 2017 to uh, pass an amendment to, the, uh, uh, to a budget line item which would uh, call for an increase of the funding which we received, which AdmiTech received last year of $500,000, hopefully to increase it up to a million dollars to carry forth with this effort. And with that uh, with that approval, they will be spending money here in Brockton to alleviate the concerns of the epidemic of prostate cancer in our in our community. And on September 16th through 18th, Abitech will be holding the first global summit in, uh, diagnos in diagnostic precision for prostate cancer at the Weston Copley Hotel in Boston, Mass. So we are we are associated with a renowned foundation that is directly affecting lives. And we'll be talking later about how our lives 
uh, yours and mine are going to be affected by the work that we'll be doing for prostate cancer. At this time, I'd like to call forth uh, uh, Janet Trask, followed by Steve Abrams, uh, to give up their portion of the presentation. And then I'll be back. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's no objection, Ms. Trask. Somebody take her picture for a change. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't look like without a camera in her hand. What's going on? I would like to begin my portion of tonight's presentation by emphasizing key points about prostate health for men. Prostate cancer is a major public health problem striking one in seven American men. It is in... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to laugh. This is serious stuff. It is serious. <laughs> it is an epidemic in Brockton that will be highlighted by others a little further down the road. Prostate cancer is the second most common cause of cancer death in men. Prostate cancer is a leading health disparity. Black and Hispanic men are 1.6 times more frequently diagnosed with prostate cancer and 2.5 times more likely to die of prostate cancer. Screening includes a PSA blood test, which is the prostate-specific antigen test, and some health care providers may also perform a digital rectal exam called the DRE. The good news, the majority of screened men have normal test results. If prostate cancer is detected during screening, it may grow slowly, and may be relatively harmless in many men. However, in a smaller proportion of men, it may be more aggressive and even life-threatening. Your risk of prostate cancer, including the aggressive type, increases if, number one, you are over age 50, number two, if you are a man with African or Hispanic roots, number three, if your family members, brother or father, had the disease. Number four, if your provider finds a firm lump on your digital rectal exam. Or number five, if your PSA is above normal for your age. And then Steve will come up. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Steve Abrams. Uh, one of my greatest accomplishments so far to date was serving this country in defense of freedom and I'd like to continue that service. Mr. Bernard had employed me to um, serve as an educator on prostate health and helping men uh, learn about prostate health. Uh, one thing about screening, first of all, I thank the, uh, this chamber for allowing us this time, uh, the state com committee for doing the heavy lifting. Uh, the Governor Baker had tweeted out, active surveillance saves lives. Uh, early detection, he quoted, uh, saved lives. So those who you love, make sure they get tested. So screening, uh, one thing about screening, if you are early detected, you have a 100% chance of survivability rate. If you are late detected, you have less than five years to live with a late detection of prostate cancer. 62% uh, of the diagnosis statewide cases of prostate cancer, 31% was in the city of Brockton mortality rate. And that's a huge number. So we are, we are educating and telling everyone, please get your screening, get your PSA checked, especially men of color. This has disproportionately affected us in a major way. Um, we are here tonight to let you know our efforts, what we have been doing. We've been knocking on doors, going to barber shops, doing everything possible just to get the word out, get tested. One thing that we have uh, been guided on with the State Commission is uh, a mailing list. A uh, 40-year-old demographic, the, the wheel is already created. We do not need to recreate the wheel. That mailing list exists. That data exists in the city. We need to target that data. Those are 40 years and older. Send them out information with some data identifying if they had gone, <coughs> do they know what prostate is all about, and uh, have they been treated before. So that's what we're here tonight to uh, continue to ask for your support and guidance and screening. The number one thing tonight, your PSA, you have to watch your PSA. And we have something called active surveillance. A lot of times you have cancer that's a harmless cancer, and that cancer at times have been treated, causes 
uh, negative effects. Nowadays, you don't have to treat that non-harmful cancer. Mm -hmm. They do active surveillance and they watch it and they watch it and they watch it. And then you and your healthcare provider will get together and find out what's the best approach. So what we had from the governor's office is what he tweeted, early detection saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. So the most important message we bring tonight is for men to talk to their health care providers, whether that be a physician or a nurse practitioner. Men must be fully informed to make shared decisions with their PCP by discussing their risk of prostate cancer. Experts recommend that all men start this conversation with their provider at age 45 and for men at higher risk of prostate cancer to start this conversation at age 40. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll talk about how important it is for us, you my brothers and sisters, to help alleviate the, the crisis of prostate cancer in Brockton. Prostate cancer mortality in Brockton and Plymouth County. The mortality rate in Plymouth County and Suffolk County is the highest in Massachusetts for black men. Prostate cancer mortality for white men is 1.15 times higher than the state average. For black men, prostate cancer mortality is 1.4, almost 1.5 times higher than the state average. Disparities in prostate cancer mortality in Brockton, 2.7 times higher for black men. Prostate cancer mortality in Brockton is greater than 3.2 times higher than breast cancer. Brockton being 65.7 out of 1,000 and breast cancer being 20.3. Prostate cancer is a leading health care disparity in adults. Prostate cancer is 2.62 more lethal than African American versus the white population. Diabetes is 1.71 times more lethal in African, -American, African Americans than the white population. Stroke is 1.38 times more lethal in African, -American, African Americans than the white population. Only heart disease are as lethal in African American as the white population. This illustrates that there is a significant disparity among whites and blacks when it comes to contracting <laughs> prostate cancer versus other diseases in our midst. Ending the prostate cancer in Brockton, we in AdmiTech and the partners that have joined us are going to initiate a statewide program based in research because all of the information that we're giving you today and all of, the all of the information that we'll be giving you in the future will be based upon research led by ADMIPEC Foundation. Statewide program in research, education and awareness, creating a Massachusetts model of national leadership, which I am told will begin right here in Brockton because we, our state representatives, and hopefully you, the City Council of Brockton, will help support this effort. We, the City of Champions, are going to be leaders in prostate cancer awareness and screening, setting the example not only for the state, but for the nation. We can do it because we've done it so many other times in so many aspects of our life. Prostate cancer discriminates. And we know that in Brockton, we don't stand for discrimination. Black men are more than two and, a half, two and a half times more likely to die. That's unacceptable. The question might be why. We don't have the answer. But IADMI Tech and the funding that will be coming from the state, we hope, will be doing research 
that includes socioeconomic aspects, health aspects, and other aspects that contribute to this dreadful disease. How can you help? No, we're not asking for money tonight. We're asking for your advocacy. We might be asking for money in the future. <laughs> and I'm suppo I suppose that even though a person's health is, is very, very private, it isn't it the responsibility of the city leaders to make sure that the health of our citizens, our greatest asset, is supported by our tax dollars. With that, I, I thank you very much. I thank uh, Councillor Sullivan for bringing this resolve uh, uh, before the, the Finance Committee and the City Council. I thank all of those who have been in support of us uh, from the start, and uh, all of you as my, my, my friends and, and colleagues for your support of the future. Help us save lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. And, uh, you know, uh, the purpose of resolves, I mean, these, these are good resolves because they educate, they make people aware. And, and I want to thank Steve, Steve, and Janet. Um, this is a, a very, very pressing issue, and it is an epidemic. You are correct. Uh, so we need to tackle, uh, tackle this problem head on. I want to thank our state reps and state senator. Uh, and with that being said, I am going to make a formal favorable recommendation on this resolve back to the full city council. Second. Second. Actually, before we take the motion, uh, you done? I Council am. Councilor Razak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bernard, how are you? I'm fine. I thank you for being here tonight, and I happened to be there when you had the uh, forum after the MLK breakfast, and um, it was very informative, but I have to tell you I was astonished by the statistics it's because it hit, it's close to home. I mean, uh, it, affected, it affects all of us. Can I just ask you, I know at one point you had spoken about how you were going to bring awareness. Have you sent out any literature out to, uh, um, through whether it's the schools or anywhere to bring awareness to our community of um, prostate cancer? That's, that's a very good question, Councillor. This is a marathon, not a, not a short race. We are establishing a foundation of people, of uh, social service organizations and healthcare organizations that want to join in the partnership so that we can do this in a proper manner. We have uh, a Good Samaritan Medical Center uh, and uh, we will be talking with other health care providers. We have spoken with Brockton Hospital, and there's good news today, which I can't announce, but I think there's good news today. Uh, maybe you'll hear about it in the next couple of days. There are other, we will be going before and having an event around Father's Day. I think we're planning it for, for June 17th, and all the uh, partners that are involved will be uh, putting out information We'll be bringing expert uh, oncologists and, and doctors and research uh, uh, people from the medical field, uh, as we did on the G January 16th event, but even a broader number of people uh, coming out uh, to uh, give us a presentation on uh, cancer, uh, prostate cancer awareness and screening and education. It, it, we hope that it will be a massive event, and with your help and advocacy, we'll have uh, not, uh, not uh, tens of people there, but hundreds or more. We also intend to, to extend this uh, to our neighbors, to Greater Brockton, because an underserved area is uh, Brockton and Plymouth County, Metro South area. For some reason, there's a greater instance, in, incidence of prostate cancer in this area. We want to know why. We have to make certain that our brothers have the, initi the incentive to go and have their prostate checked beginning at age 40. Our greatest resources are our people, our men. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd Thank be happy you. to answer. Well, that's it. Um, we're looking for early detection. Any way that I can help, I know that by getting the word out there, we, I want to see people in numbers attend these um, you know, forums, whether you plan forums or whatever way you get the word out. We w we're in support of helping we, you get we have, the word out. We have uh, been before uh, Mayor, Council, uh, Mayor Carpenter, and he is giving us his support for the event uh, in June. We have also uh, talked to him about establishing a, a helpline, and we're going to look, in, uh, look into that also. As, uh, as Steve Abrams uh, mentioned, having access to targeted mailings of, for men over, over 40 years, years old, where we can send them information and advocate, and advocate uh, uh, for them to go to see their doctors would be great. 
uh, the Good Samaritan uh, uh, Medical Center uh, has given me permission to say that th they will have a support group uh, and they will have a number for which we'll be able to direct people to go, to, to go and get services. I have some good news. Something about Brockton Hospital is coming up. Uh, and uh, I think that the, all of the health care services in Brockton would be remiss uh, in not joining us in this effort. I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud of all the people that are involved in this, and I ask you for your help. Thank, thank you. you. You can stay right there, Councillor Barnes. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bernard, uh, Mr. Abrams, and Ms. Trask for your information, and, and the gentleman that is also here, too, to provide you know, any additional information that we may need. But I, uh, um, not being intimately uh, familiar kind of with the whole prostate cancer uh, issue and, and how it affects uh, our city and our, our men, like you said, our men are the cornerstone of the family. Um, and if we're losing them at this rate, you know, I, it just it scares me to think of the future if, if we don't kind of do something now as a community. So now with the, the numbers that you presented, um, how do we, is, would, would we consider this a public health crisis here in Brockton? Like, has it been designated, I guess, is my question. Yes, it is a public health uh, crisis. Yes, it is uh, a, a, of epidemic proportion. Uh, yes, it is uh, uh, omnipresent. We all know uh, people, some of the leaders of our city who have, who have succumbed to prostate cancer and others have prostate cancer. And in your family, there's probably mm -hmm. uh, some uh, person that has because it's so, um, so um, uh, omnipresent. Uh, to classify it as an emergency, I don't know that a health, the health organization has done so. There are some controversial issues relative to screening uh, that... I will not speak to as a professional, but I encourage you all to come and hear from the professionals to discuss uh, the, the controversial issues relative uh, to screening. Uh, and this is why we're, we're not doing it alone. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we're a part of an uh, organization that, that's growing. But truly, uh, truly, uh, we have to uh, <coughs> perceive what's before us. That which you manifest is before you. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning what? In this case, let's be proactive rather than reactive right. to uh, conquering this disease. Okay. And um, I, I just want to also say, too, you know, if anything that I can do personally or, or professionally to help in your efforts to get the word out, I will definitely do. And I'm glad um, that this is getting a little more attention because two years ago I tried to start a, a citywide No Shave November uh, Act. And... Uh, there were just several of us that joined on, but hopefully this year maybe uh, the NAACP and, and your, your health um, unit may want to take that on this year because uh, that also can garner a lot of um, regional and even national support uh, for early detection and awareness. But one other thing, too, I just want, like you said, it's a marathon, so maybe as you all are going up the Heartbreak Hill part of this marathon, um, if you haven't thought of it already, Harbor One, uh, they do a lot of community resource things you know, regarding the Brockton Knocks Down Diabetes. They're planning you know, the, uh, that, the, that week of events right now, and that might be something, too, to partner with them uh, and having them maybe do some highlighted uh, events and community events and sponsorship uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that that happens, too. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. We will be writing grants, mm -hmm. uh, not through the NAACP, but through Admi Admitech, as right. they, they are 501c3, and it's the reason that I, that I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, grants that uh, we bring to uh, and through uh, Admitech, uh, will, the people of Brockton will benefit from. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor? I already made a motion. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend this to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to full city council, and thank you very much uh, for you and your team for being here. Nice. Uh, Councilors, I believe 16, and I'm going to take 16 and 20 together, but they'll take a while. I would uh, entertain a motion to take item 17 out of order. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make that motion 17 out of order. Second. Second. Motion made and second. Take no item number 17 next. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. I, uh, item number 17, yeah, please. Yeah. Resolved that Mrs. Janice Fitzgerald, Executive Director of the Brockton Council on Aging, appear before the Finance Committee to provide a status update on the COA and to discuss all efforts to prepare for the aging process. Invited Janice Fitzgerald, Executive Director, Council on Aging. Mr. Chairman, 
Counselor. Uh, I follow this resolve uh, at the request of uh, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Uh, we all know Janice. She, she does yeoman's work um, uh, with, with her assistance down at the Council on Aging. And it's it, on a daily, daily uh, uh, regime. I mean, the place is packed. And it, it really is a, a, a vital um, sure. agency within the, the city <coughs> of Brockton and the surrounding areas. So with that being said, thank you for being here, Janice. Thank you. I just and I'm just going to put a little... You're not going to tell us all efforts to prepare everybody for the aging process, are you? Well, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> but I do... Um, Thank you for being here. I do have a brief presentation. It should take about 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> so oh, if you just bear with me. Same as usual, you mean. Aging. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be in the Council on Aging pretty soon if you keep that up. So thank you all for the opportunity to be here tonight to talk about one of my most favorite things, the Council on Aging. Tonight I'd like to talk briefly about what we've been up to, some new programs, our capital campaign, and the rapid growth of the elder population, which Councillor Farwell touched briefly on um, in one of your comments. For those of you who are new to the Council, let me take a minute and explain the role of the COA in the community. The COA is mandated to assess the needs and provide programs and services to seniors aged 60 and older, and we strive to improve their quality of life. We are committed to helping our seniors age with dignity and security. Our funding comes from a few sources, with the largest amounts coming from the city in the Executive Office of Elder Affairs Formula Grant. The formula grant is calculated based on the number of seniors in Brockton from the 2010 census. And that number, I've said before, and I know someone's going to remember, how many elders do we have in Brockton? <coughs> Oh, a lot. No. It's like not wrong. Write this down. Yeah. 15,883 individuals 60 or older. I was recently before you to seek acceptance of the FY16 formula grant funds in the amount of $142,947,000. That translates to us receiving $9 per elder. Mm -hmm. Luckily for us, our legislators, and I wish our state reps had stayed because they were a huge part of pushing for the um, per dollar figure to increase for FY17 to $10 an elder. That is huge for me. That allows me um, to bring in additional staff, which I'll talk about shortly. <clears throat> the legislators realize that the cu current number of elders from that 2010 census is not an accurate number. And in fact, the number has increased and will continue to grow significantly since that census. So we continue to push every single year with other COAs um, and people from Executive Office Elder Affairs to keep that increase going. So, as I stated, the increase in funds allows me to bring in staff to add to my present two and a half staffs, staff people, with myself being one. <coughs> so, who's the half? So we are in some serious need of additional staffing. Since I was here before you last year, we have seen our center grow. On average, we see roughly over 100 visitors a day. We welcomed anywhere from 7 to, new, seven to 10 new members a week. We provided assistance to approximately 100 seniors and families a month. We also offered congregate meals two days a week and served over 3,000 meals. The number of recorded swipes to our center last year was an unbelievable 17,399. And let's not forget the over 14,000 phone calls that we, we took in. So as you can see, we're very busy. 
and although very exhausting at times, we continue to provide an opportunity for our elders to live a lifestyle based on independence. All of this hard work gets done thanks greatly to my dedicated staff and our over 80 committed volunteers. Along with the everyday social and recreational activities that we offer, we also started the Senior Property Tax Workoff Program. We now offer um, the Registry of Motor Vehicle Online Transactions for seniors so that they can renew their licenses, their registrations, do a change of address, um, replace a disability placard, all without having to go and sit at the registry. Under the direction of the mayor, the creation of the Senior Safety Task Force was started. The mission of this task force is to enhance the quality of life for seniors in the community by providing resources and support to assure their safety and well-being as they age. Our objective is to reach the seniors who are in need of resources and support. The Council on Aging is and should be the first stop on the elder care continuum. We have designated a hotline at the COA for seniors and or their families to call for assistance. This is not an emergency hotline. Folks should call 911 in an emergency. This is a line for information, referrals, resources, and support. The number to call is 508-941-0292. And if that isn't enough, <coughs> We also have joined with the Greater Boston Food Bank to participate in the Commodity Supplemental Food Program. This program is for elders who qualify based on self-declaring income guidelines. Qualified elders would receive two 15-pound bags of health, healthy shelf-stable products for free at the center once a month. The bags would include cereal, juice, stew, peanut butter, pasta, applesauce, canned vegetables, and cheese. I encourage you all to refer any senior to us that you think might benefit from this program, and I have included some information in the packet for you. In addition to needing more staff, we are in need of more space. In the fall, we will finally be kicking off our capital campaign to raise funds for the new addition. And this is kind of a private little joke, but there will be some more opportunities for naming rights of the light switch. <coughs> Do a whole light yep. picture this time. Let me check my wallet. I got 10. <laughs> I, got 10. I think we're up to $10. Weren't we? All right, guys. Quiet. Kind of so lastly, and most importantly, let me talk about the rapid projected growth increase of the elder population in Massachusetts and Brockton in the next few years. According to the Administration on Aging, from 2010 to 2030, the growth rate of the elderly exceeds that of the population under age 65. The Executive Director of the Mass Council on Aging, David Stevens, states that by the end of this year, Massachusetts will have more residents who are at least 60 years or older than the residents who, that are 20 or younger. He continues to say that we can't service everyone with the current dollars we have. <coughs> Communities are going to have to recognize that they're going to need to put additional resources into senior services. He hopes that legislators and municipal leaders recognize the importance of getting ahead of this issue and being proactive, and I agree. You have in front of you a chart that demonstrates the rapid increase projected for Brockton through 2020. And as you look at that chart, mm -hmm. you will see we have some big numbers coming at us. We're right in the middle of that population growth. Some may think that the number may decrease as our seniors pass on, but the fact of the matter is that is untrue. We are living longer and living in the community as opposed to living in an institution. And by a show of hands, who is looking forward to living in an institution? It's easier. There's something Jeff? for everybody. Oh, he put me in one. It's a race. Who can by the get way, the how many people here agree with Moses that he should go there? 
<laughs> Just like as that. I thought. <laughs> we at the Council on Aging strive to provide our seniors with the opportunity and resources to stay at home and age in place. Institutional care, as we know, is costly and not the place we all want to end up. Based on figures from John McGarry's office, we are anticipating roughly 1,000 individuals who will be turning 65 next year, which will cause a strain on the COA as they come to us to help them navigate through the Medicare process. We are currently serving three distinct cohorts of older adults, the World War II generation, the silent generation, and the baby boomers, all with diverse and complex needs. So, as you heard this evening, we are very busy. We are providing services and supports to the elders the best that we can. And I hope I have made you aware of my concern for the elder population growth in the years to come. In closing, thank you for your time and attention. I urge you all to be pro proactive as we prepare for this rapid growth of the aging population. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions, but you'll have to speak loudly because my ears are still ringing from the council cords on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <coughs> council Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Janice, I want to just thank you and your staff, uh, those two and a half people uh, that work uh, really on a, on a regular daily basis to benefit the lives of many, many seniors. So thank you. Um, my question is, is just is one question, actually. Uh, last legislative session, we passed the Senior Citizen and Veterans Work Off uh, program. You volunteer, you get a, a tax break on your real estate taxes if you uh, own a single family home. A and it was more work on, on you, quite honestly. Could you just give us an update? How many people actually applied for that? So I was anticipating hundreds of people. I received eight applications. How many? Eight? Eight. Wow. Well, the veterans only had two, so you're ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's going to increase. Yep. Be optimistic. Yep. But thank so you So we'll very keep much. on it and see what happens. <clears throat> yep. Thank you. Makes thank a you. difference. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Barnes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I, I echo my colleagues' um, sentiments and thanking you for all that you do. You know I love coming over there. I on one hand, I can't wait to turn 60 so I can join officially, and then on the <laughs> other hand, I, I don't know. We'll talk about it. But I just wanted to uh, just bring something up. You did mention that you know, seniors are probably one of the larger populations at risk of being scammed um, and for people calling and, and just taking advantage of them you know, merely for their age and, and you know, trying to get money, their money, hands on their pensions. But the Attorney General's office is actually, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, tomorrow actually she's holding a scams and schemes uh, workshop in New Bedford. And I, it's not technically geared towards seniors, but I guess it's just in general, just, you know, w people. But I wanted to, um, maybe we can sit down and, and work on that and maybe get her here or get her staff here to do uh, one of these trainings for our seniors in particular and then maybe kind of pull it out. But I did want to just um, let you know that that is happening and that is something that the Attorney General's office is, is looking into, just scams in general and yeah. targeting um, it to your population. So I just wanted to put that. Yeah, we'd love to have something like that. We do our best to educate over and over again. Right. Um, and the seniors are starting to get it. Right. But unfortunately, you still have a group that is just so trusting and They're very sophisticated, too, the schemes they come up with. It's awful. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Lally. I just want to uh, just want to thank you for, for all, you know, all, all you and your group do. And uh, I'm not I'm not there yet, but my my grandparents and their, you know, their friends and you know that age, they certainly do appreciate it. Um, just one quick question, because I know it's I know it's a little late. Who uh, who does have the uh, the naming rights right now to the light switch? Who's <coughs> um, the only one that actually gave cash? Uh, uh, let I'll, me see. I, I put in some. I put in gave some one dollar. <laughs> No, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. I don't have that right in front. It could be you, yes. Thank you. <laughs> that it? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a favorable recommendation back to full city council. Second. Okay, before we get to the motion, we have a few other people who want to talk. The next person to qualify for the uh, Council on Aging Services, Council of Monaghan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not joking. He's uh, in I did turn now. 60 this year. When's your birthday? I'm not till later this yeah, year. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a friend. Uh, we just want to let you know that we're going to waive our $2,000 fee we normally get for playing next year for the St. Patrick's Day. 
Help you out a little bit. That's awful kind. Thank you. <laughs> Am I supposed to get a cut of that? Not so far, well. Oh, you know about that? I guess I'm overqualified to talk about the aging process, but uh, all, in all seriousness, uh, after my brief 20-year vacation from, from government, uh, I was down at the facility, and unfortunately, a lot of the husbands had passed away, and your facility means everything to the women who are left behind, the social interaction, the activities that are offered, and I think those are the little nuances to a council on aging that we, we sometimes don't focus on. And uh, I just want to thank you for what you do, and, and it was a pleasure to see how much it meant to, uh, to everyone, but especially to those who had lost their husbands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Razak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I can't not say anything, but Thank you for being here. Thank you for the update. And you do throw the best parties. I hear it all around town. So thank you for including all of us in those parties and inviting us. So it's always a pleasure to be there. Thank you. And thank you all for all your support. Um, I have a question here. How far out do you want to expand the building? Um, the initial plan is to go from the back of the building out to the sidewalk. So it would be the, the width of the building all the way out. We're actually going to gain a row of parking, believe it or not, and we're hoping to see if we can get some additional parking space because that's a huge challenge for us. Maybe work with the Y, um, the building out back, and see if we could do something there. So it's going to be a good size addition. Okay, and I believe if you started or is it in, it's in the process? or um, We have raised some funds. Um, I have a campaign committee. We meet every two weeks. So the momentum and enthusiasm is great. So we're really clicking along and we're hoping to make, a, make an announcement soon with a kickoff in the fall with a big party. So um, be ready with your checkbooks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Beauregard. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, of course, Janice, thank you. I spent um, a little more time than some other people in uh, the Council on Aging because of my other uh, activities. And um, one of the things, it is really um, disappointing that so many people at 60 and over need um, the um, Greater Boston Food Bank services. But what I also want to point out is p um, you have many how would I say, information, much information on many other services that individuals find themselves in need of. And um, I want to commend you for having over 80 volunteers and recognizing them because we all know how valuable volunteers are in this community. And uh, Council on Aging has repeatedly demonstrated how much they're appreciated. Thank you, and you know, we have our, you have our support. Thank you very much. And you know, the need for food is probably more than you folks even realize. I would say on a daily basis we're trying to find food for individuals that come in. So um, it is a big problem in the community. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for all you do. Uh, and of course, near and dear to my heart, uh, with the building being named after my Aunt Mary, it uh, will certainly be helping out. And we'll do more than a light, a light switch. Motion has been made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Councilor Razak. Since, since we're taking 16 and 20 collectively, can we take number 19 out of order, please? Second. Motion made and seconded to take item 19 out of order. All those in favor? Opposed? Madam Clerk, please read number 19. Resolved that the City Council of the City of Brockton hereby requests that the fiscal year 17 Chapter 70 budget funding for low-income students be revised so that the communities whose districts educate the vast majority of low-income or economically disadvantaged students are adequately assisted in accomplishing this objective. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Kathleen A. Smith, J.D. Superintendent. Mr. Chairman, this is my resolve. So Councilor Azak. The purpose of this resolve is um, really to inform Brockton families the detrimental effect that the um, governor's uh, FY17 budget has on our public schools. Um, yes, Brockton kids count, and it is our job to fight for their best interest. I believe um, all my colleagues are in support of this. I have requested that a letter be sent to the governor 
to the Senate President and the Speaker of the House to make sure they know that Brockton students can't be left behind. So with that said, I ask um, Mr. Con kindly if he can just um, update us with the um, Governor's budget. I know there's been some changes, but um, just an overall view of the budget. Well, I can speak about the numbers a little bit, and if you have questions as to what the consequences are in the classroom, obviously Superintendent Smith would be better qualified to speak about that. So the issue really is funding and changes in the government's governor's budget, rather, as to how the um, uh, so-called uh, foundation budget, the education reform budget, was calculated. And uh, in the governor's budget, the main the main difference that's affecting Brockton uh, severely was a change in how the state is counting our entitlement to cost reimbursement for low-income students. In earlier years, the, uh, <clears throat> the qualification for getting that money depended upon the enrollment that the city uh, school system had of students who qualified for free or reduced lunch. Uh, for some years, the state has been looking to move away from using that mechanism to count your eligibility to a different way which basically looks at the number of students who are enrolled in direct assistance programs from the state such as for um, uh, welfare payments or uh, Department of uh, Children and Families Assistance, uh, wards of the state, that kind of a headcount. The, um, this is the first year they've moved to making that headcount the basis at, on the governor's budget for giving you your low income qualification. And that resulted in the loss of about 40% of our population who otherwise would have qualified under the old formula. Now the governor's budget attempted to make up for that somewhat by creating a new rate for which you got paid on those students. And Brockton gets the highest rate, but the rate's about 25% higher and the loss of population was about 40%. And therefore we don't come out with uh, an even break on it. And in fact, the result is a loss of almost $6 million in our Chapter 70 funding, uh, which is directly attributable to those low-income students. So <clears throat> when that result came out, the governor's budget looked at that c consequence, and a lot of cities uh, like Brockton were badly affected by it. And the mechanism they tried to use to make it so that there wasn't a loss of money for the city in Chapter 70 funding, the money that comes for funding our school system, uh, they put an increase of $30, a minimum increase of $30 per student on each one of our students. So that brought us from a $6 million loss to a slight increase from last year, $300,000. That's 0.2%, $300,000, 0.2%. And we're still looking at a foundation budget, which is $6 million lower than it should have been under the old system. So, And the foundation budget is an entitlement. That extra money is subject to appropriation every year. So that's the basic problem. That's what we're looking to, to address with this resolve. I, I would like to say that in the time since this information was given to Councillor Azak and the time that the uh, uh, budget was filed by the governor, uh, the House Ways and Means Committee has made its own recommendation for education funding. And our legislative delegation did yeoman's work on that. There is an increase in that per pupil allotment from $30 plus to $50. That's worth an extra $600,000. In addition to that, they've created a kind of pothole fund uh, to be administered in the fall by the Department of Education. I think it's worth about $10 million statewide. Brockton is one of the most severely impacted communities in this change, and so I would think we'd get a substantial portion of that. We won't know it unless it's in the final budget, and we won't know the amount because we have to apply for it next year. And the final thing that the Ways and Means budget out of the House did was to provide additional money in our Chapter 70 funding for charter school tuition reimbursement funds. So uh, that's just House Ways and Means. We're waiting to see what the House as a whole does. We're waiting to see what Senate Ways and Means, and then the Senate, then Conference Committee, and then the Governor. But I would say that since the uh, problem was first identified back at uh, late February, early March, there has been progress which has helped us. And uh, I'm grateful to the legislative delegation for that. And I think whatever you can do to support that effort with this resolve, I'm glad it was introduced because uh, it'll show the sense of the Council, I'm sure, is to, is to push ahead with the kind of changes that came out of House Ways and Means. And if there are questions on the specific consequences in the budget, I think probably the superintendent is better. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Actually, superintendent, if you could, I know that you, there are some members of the school committee out there tonight. I can't see whoever is here. Can you let us know who's here from the school committee? Yes, we have uh, Brett Gormley from Ward 4. I see Judy Sullivan, Ward 5, and Tim Sullivan, Ward 7. Thank you. Thank you very much, school committee people. 
Uh, again, I think we've had quite a bit of this information, and this was resolved for, so that we could let the governor know that this board is behind, uh, behind the issue. Uh, are you all set for now? Um, I am. I, I don't... Councillor Barnes. Well, I, I kind of wanted to hear uh, Superintendent Smith's Barnes, presentation thanks. before I ask a question, because she might answer my question in her presentation. Well, uh, as far as the presentation goes, the first thing I want to echo, uh, as uh, Mr. Condon has said, I can't thank our leg uh, legislative delegation enough for the work that they have been doing for months now. But I have to say, and I know all of you have been along for this ride, I don't think there is any community like Brockton where your city council comes together with your school committee, comes together with your legislative delegation, and we have certainly made some noise. And I think it has made a difference. Uh, you can go back to March. Uh, I was actually invited to represent the Mass Association for School Superintendents and speak to the Joint Committee of the House and Senate Ways and Means. And we were representing all communities. But the best part for me, after we represented you know, the dilemma that we were in, was when they asked individual questions and asked me and said, Superintendent Smith, you know, what is, what is this going to do to Brockton if there is no change? And I was able to talk about kindergarten class sizes presently with some being 27 in a class, unacceptable. You know, talking about some of our high school classes, especially our lab classes, students looking to go to college with 35 students in a class. You know, looking for materials that we are unable to purchase as we've continually cut this budget. This will be my third year as superintendent in a budget process, and that's what has been done for three years running, trying to keep a school system going. Technology budget continues to be cut. So again, I think we're moving forward. Uh, we're dealing with this head on. We've had uh, a campaign. You all have your Brockton kids count, but it's much more than that. It is finally not only alerting our community, but our goal is to continue to educate our parents, our community, about not just this particular budget, but what our children need in this city. Many of you probably saw this past Sunday a Boston Globe magazine report, and it talked about the best places to live in different communities. And I'm not going to call those communities out. This is the best place to live. But what I want to tell you is when you look at that, they talk about that educational system. They talk about the student-teacher ratio. That's what they're talking about for home values going up and a place where you want to bring up your family and your kids. So I can't thank you enough. We're still in the middle of the battle, but we certainly, again, are having our voices heard. We've come together as a community, and we will continue to address this concern. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Condon and um, Dr. Smith. I do want to... Um, just ask a question. That several things have come uh, uh, to me I, from residents and via, actually via social media. I've seen it really all over the place in a few calls about the Barrett Russell School. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know if you can maybe address some of the rumors about, you know, its closure or whatever's happening. Councilor, uh, we can't really get into too much on their budget yet. They haven't done it yet themselves, this, their board. Um, oh, this, they is, haven't? this resolve is really about making sure that we uh, this board is stating that uh, the formula needs to be addressed and again where they haven't had a chance to uh, actually have their meetings and, and make their decisions um, we can't get too much into specifics of what the budget will be because they don't know yet themselves okay uh, I'm you happy know, I mean, in a broad sense if you want to ask but specifically what what will happen we can't really get into yet at this point okay well I just kind of wanted to find out where that came from but we can talk about it later or, or I'll, I'll follow the school committee's um, meeting on that but I'm happy to speak to you about that okay and as I said uh, yeah I mean if you want to address it in a broad well, brush the, what I'll say you, broadly you is uh, one of the things we committed to our school committee as we prepare this very difficult budget mm -hmm. is back uh, by March 25th our recommendation was going to be to take a look at administration district-wide and I've been very very clear and I've heard people talk about you know school department is top-heavy we have almost 3,000 employees in the Brockton Public Schools and close to 18,000 students in the Brockton Public Schools with the fourth largest school district in the state and in making those cuts on March 25th it was 1.5 million looking at a 10 million dollar deficit mm -hmm. the one thing I want to say again is it what it made your district <coughs> is certainly a weaker district without those positions but we are realigning some things we're working very hard the next uh, recommendation to our school committee which was at the last meeting uh, was looking at everything that doesn't necessarily touch the classroom 
and it was looking at athletics and not wiping out athletics but maybe looking at those programs that aren't as heavily participated in as others taking a look at some after school activities looking at the per capita budget you know ways that we were not cutting teachers at this point that was going to be the second rounds of cuts and what's difficult is we're still watching the city budget which again won't be finalized till probably sometime late May into June we have our state budget which I don't have figures and we're so heavily reliant on those figures that it is really a moving target mm -hmm. that is we're making cuts we're waiting to see if some of that funding comes back mm -hmm. and we'll be able to reverse those cuts and you ask about school closings I'd like to be able to stand in front of you and talk about you know the possibility or the charter is coming to Brockton grades 6, 7th and 8th to start but I don't have those figures I've spent two hours in the DESE trying to firm up those figures or when I'll get those figures that's something the school committee will have to look at as soon as we finish this budget looking at next year to see where we're at okay. um, so again I do not want to close any schools but presently I have made some recommendations based on really kind of a moving target um, and our last uh, recommendation to the school committee because of a May 15th deadline according to the contract with our Brockton Education Association mm -hmm. for May 15th would be teacher layoffs and we are anticipating those at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, on, on that front and thank you Mr. Chairman. But I, I ha actually have a question for Mr. Condon. Actually, you know what? Um, excuse me, Superintendent Smith, <coughs> I can ask you one more thing. The campaign, the Brockton Kids Count, um, the kickoff was tremendous and you know it's getting a lot of support and people are aware of it and, and I, I feel that they're supporting it. The feedback from outside that the people are supporting it, especially parents of students, Brockton Public School students. When we first saw the original kind of information um, with the breakdown of how the budget w was going to impact the different areas in the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, 195 of them were in the lower area that Brockton was listed under at the time. So um, I know that there was some discussion about possibly um, starting some kind of uh, coalition with the other communities. Have there been other sister campaigns to um, that, that we might be able to partner on in order to get this kind of more teeth? I uh, actually had an urban superintendent's meeting back uh, in early April. Mm -hmm. I brought uh, all of our information, talked about our kickoff campaign, mm -hmm. and I know similar campaigns are happening in Chelsea and Revere. I'm not sure of other communities. Those were the communities heavily hit. We're certainly working with our legislative delegation groups, and, and I thank all of you. Many of you were there that evening. It was a wonderful kickoff. Uh, next week, I do want to bring to people's attention that we have what we're calling uh, a week, uh, a blitz of our Brockton Kids Count. Uh, there's been some really fun things talked about out there, you know, not only doing a kickoff, but also having a social media day, posting, you know, pictures of yourself with your signs, your T-shirts, you know, your support for Brockton Kids Count. I believe on the Wednesday at 6 o'clock, we're looking to assemble families, some things for families up at Brockton High School with our Rocky statue in the background and taking a photo of our Brockton kids count and sending that and tweeting that you know back to those making these decisions mm -hmm. uh, certainly at our state house during the budget process ending up with um, our kids our kids are looking for things to do our high school students involved in so many activities talking about how they can help so from our various youngest students talking about why they count and why their education is important to our middle school and our high school kids. I think it'll be a great week for the community to highlight what an excellent school system you have and that people do care about our children in this community. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I, I guess I have a question to you um, to ask <coughs> if my next question is appropriate. Mr. Condon brought up the pothole fund. I kind of want to... He can explain what that is, certainly. Okay. Is that... And my specific question, I know you said it really hasn't been designed yet, but um, can you maybe anticipate kind of what the criteria could be or what we would need to do in, in your professional experience as a CFO? Well, what it looks like to me is that the, uh, if the House Ways and Means budget survives as proposed, mm -hmm. uh, there would be about uh, $10 million of state money set aside to be administered by the Department of Education in order to, to distribute uh, funds to communities who had the biggest adverse consequence mm -hmm. for this change in the low income formula. So what the specific mechanism would be to apply for that, I don't know. Okay. But in the state, I think there was no community which was badly as badly affected as the city of Brockton. So I think you know, we would stand to get a good piece of that. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Any other uh, questions? Councilor Azak. 
I just want to thank Mr. Khan for everything you've done to, for, with your help with this resolve and thank you superintendent and the school committee members. I know I've spoken with all of them and we're all on, we're in this together and um, we're, we're very proud of our school. So um, thank you again and I move to recommend favorably to the full city second. council. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Pass it unanimously. Thank you and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Madam Clerk, item number uh, 20, and actually I understand a recommend a uh, motion to take 20, uh, excuse me, uh, 16 and 20 together, please. Okay. So I'll move. Second. Second. Motion made to take items number 16 and 20 together, where there will be the same people up there. Uh, motions made and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk, would you read items number 16 and 20? Resolved to have Gary Leonard B21, Mike Gellerini and Robert Jenkins Brockton Redevelopment Authority to explain the role of Main Street Manager resolved to call the above name to update us on the proposed projects and future projects on Main Street and to describe the responsibilities of the Main Street <coughs> Manager and to whom does he report results or re recent job performance and under what financing does the position provide his salary. Invited Gary Leonard B21, Main Street Manager. Michael Gallerino, Executive Director, Brockton 21st Century Corp. And Robert Jenkins, Executive Director, VRA. In resolve, members of the 21st Century Corp. come before a committee of this council to update the council on the Rock Stadium and the Conference Center. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Todd Marlin, Senior Vice President, General Manager, Brockton Rocks. Michael Gallerino, Executive Director, Brockton 21st Century Corp. John Marion, Chairperson, Brockton 21st Century Corp., and Matthew Osborne, Treasurer of Brockton 21st Century Corp. Councilors, thank you. I put these two together because 20 obviously is just bringing the same people back with any specific questions you might have after they were a couple of weeks ago when they were here for the. Uh, that was originally my resolve, but um, I received my packet today and I haven't had a chance to go through it, so I will leave it open to my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the only thing I'm going to ask is if we. Uh, Try not to be too redundant here. Mr. Council Chairman, Sullivan. I was also going to say that uh, Mr. Chris English, uh, owner of the Rocks, is here as well, along with Todd, Todd Marlin. So if there's no objections. If there's no objections, when Thank uh, you. If anybody has particular questions, uh, we'll concentrate on number 16 to start. Okay. But if you. anybody has questions. Uh, who filed 16? Uh, um, I did, Council. Council Beauregard. Okay. The reason I filed this is because of there was a lot of uh, confusion. Um, with uh, the role of the Main Street manager. And uh, since we had Rob May do a fabulous presentation this evening on why we need to concentrate on downtown, I wanted some things cleared up because um, it doesn't seem like the momentum of Main Street is um, happening the way we wish. Now, I did receive my B21 information on Friday, and I have read everything here in some of these items twice and I also want to mention that I've read uh, the BRA draft that is available at uh, the libraries and in City Council, um, I'm sorry, in um, City Hall Mayor's office and at uh, your office Mr. Jenkins. So I'd like to thank you both for being here tonight. So what I guess I wanted was an update. I was pleased to finally receive this job description because I don't believe we're seeing a whole lot of what this job description mentions being accomplished and that's that's where my concern was because Main Street is still not a very active retail um, how would I say it, corridor and uh, there just seems to be you know a lot of frustration with certain situations going on for those that are in fact in business on Main Street, um, expressions, concerns about um, individuals in the homeless population, et cetera. And uh, this is where I, like I said, broke this up here. And I looked at, you know, the goals too of uh, the 21st Century Corp. And it just seems that things were concentrated on other areas instead of the um, Main Street and downtown. So I guess um, that's where I'd like to know where we're going with this. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, you are correct. The Main Street manager, uh, that was the position was created in 2014, and in two, 2015 we moved forward with creating a, a Brockton Main Streets program. 
the Main Street manager because he is funded uh, currently under with CDBG funds, which Mr. Jenkins will speak to. Uh, we have to concentrate on an area that uh, is low and moderate income. Uh, the decision was made that the focus would be on Campello because, in fact, we are voting, as you saw through Mr. May's presentation, a great deal in downtown in terms of planning and whatever. Uh, Campello <coughs> is different. It's a matter of trying to bring services to the, to the um, business owners and the commercial property owners so that it's almost a self-help program. And uh, the Main Street's manager, in fact, is the boots on the ground person that delivers the strategies that are developed at the B21 level. Um, and a model, again, a modeled after the national program in the uh, Boston Main Streets program. Thank you. And I guess if Mr. Uh, Jenkins could come up and describe the, the process with the CBDG money and uh, Sure. For those plans. of you who don't Thank know, you. my name is Robert Jenkins. I'm the Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Uh, the Main Street Manager Program is funded through Community Development Block Grant, CDBG. I think initially we first thought, uh, looking at Main Street, we were thinking of the Main Street corridor, which runs from Avon to oh, sure. the Bridgewater Line, which we then saw that it needed to be a more of a concentration. If you run all along Main Street, if you look at the census tracts, all the census tracts running down Main Street are basically low and mod income. But we needed to focus um, because we, obviously, that was just too large, and that may be the first year. Please understand that Brockton is well behind most communities that run a Main Street program. Um, we're only two years into this. Most communities, gateway communities, if you think about it, have been in this program 15 to 20 years. Um, it is a fundable activity under the HUD regulations. We have concentrated in Campello because, as you heard earlier from Rob May description, the TDI fellow will also be doing the downtown Main Street activities as one of its um, one of its activities. Um, at this point in time, I think that considering where we at and the goals that we set, I think um, Michael had forwarded you a job description as well as a contract. Yes. The BRA is is just the funding kind of management agent for CDBG. Okay. So our contract is with Brockton 21st Century. We do monitor it on a quarterly basis. Um, they do have an annual at the end of the year, also monitoring section. Uh, we'll go through and see where they're at. Um, if there's any other questions directed at the CDBG funds or how we look or monitor the Main Street Managers Program, like all our other programs, I'd be more than happy to answer them. No. Okay, thank you. And I open up to my colleagues, I guess. Council Barnes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, <coughs> I actually have a question on something you just mentioned. So uh, the CDBG funds are monitored through the BRA? Correct. We but manage them for the city. Okay. And this is for the Main Street program or the Main Street manager? This is the Main Street program. We, ma we monitor the Main Street program. The manager itself is hired. Its responsibility is to B21. Okay. So maybe, I don't know if you can answer this then. I, I guess I'm Thank just you. trying to figure out wh what are the metrics for determining success and growth and mm -hmm. failure and all that stuff. If um, there's, if there there's is. A there is actually a good question. Okay. The, the Main Street program operates under the National Preservation Historic um, Trust, and there are four pillars really to that, met that metrics. One is economic, they call it now economic vitality, used to be economic restructuring design, promotion, and the last one is organization. That's one of the reasons why we also picked Campello. They were the most organized yeah. business district in the city. And just to back up, the city has actually three that we, everybody identifies with, downtown, Montello, Campello. Right. But there's also the west side, which is, I think, uh, Council uh, Farwell had pointed out that down Belmont Street has become a business district for Brockton, mm -hmm. as well as the east side. Um, but those three are the kind of the main that have been organized, especially Campello. It's also the most diverse. It serves the most diverse population in Brockton. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about metrics and how do we measure it, we measure it against the national program. Okay. And are those evaluations available and are they done? Always. 
Okay. And they're done on a quarterly basis. Okay. Can you tell us maybe just a Reader's Digest version of what the last two to three years have uh, yielded? Um, it has yielded some success for HUD and for the BRA. The success is probably in the analysis and getting information about low and moderate income, full-time, part-time employees, mm -hmm. businesses that are low and moderate income, mm -hmm. um, and who they service. Um, as you know, in Brockton, our, our demographics is changing, especially in Campello. Mm -hmm. So you kind of also want to know what technical assistance is needed for those businesses. That to me is kind of the meat and potatoes of our first analysis. And it took us a while to get there, but I think we're finally there. Okay. And then that's going to be filtered into the uh, UPR and all that stuff. It'll be filtered into all of that once we get down into Campello. That'll be a definitely a great resource okay. to have that kind of data. Rental space, what's available, how much square footage, all that information, and who they serve, which is really important to HUD when they do our analysis on the BRA or on the city as a whole looking at its economic development activity. Right. Okay. And, and because it is a federally monit umbrella monitored program, are there any kind of, um, I guess, milestones that we have to meet or, or uh, developmental you know, advantages sure. that we have to meet with this program or else we're going to get it taken away or it, not funded or whatever? Uh, here's the thing. And in HUD, they look at this program as kind of like a two to four year stretching it program before it becomes self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, there are several communities that gone into five, six years, and HUD has said that, no, we won't fund it for a fifth or sixth year. So there is a timeline that, this, that HUD will look at in order for the p program to be self-sufficient. Most main streets, if you look at the ones, forget Boston, look at Somerville, Springfield, Worcester, they're all nonprofits, the main street. They've evolved into nonprofits for those districts. Mm -hmm. So that's what, I mean, we're on a time frame to answer your question. Yes, there's a time frame mm -hmm. for it to be self-sufficient and not funded fully by the CDBG funds. Okay. And so now with this, is it TDI fellow? Is that what it's yeah. called? Yes. Okay, so this gentleman's going to be coming in, um, and I meant to ask Mr. May at the time had he started, but I got the feel that he had not yet He had started. not, May 1st. Okay, May 1st. So this gentleman's going to start. Are we going to be duplicating kind of efforts of our Main Street program and this gentleman and what he's doing to support the... Um Absolutely not. Okay. Um, our Main Street program is going to focus clearly on Campello. He's going to clearly focus on downtown. Downtown meaning probably running from our urban renewal district, which is Pleasant Street, probably all the way to uh, right before Crescent Street, where the courthouse is, the garage. Okay. That'll be his main focus for okay. the TDI. Okay. All right. And I'll, I'll reserve my questions for later. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Farwell. <coughs> uh, good evening, gentlemen. I actually have something I'd like to go over with Mr. Gallerani. And it involves the report that uh, you submitted to us. And may I assume that that was written pursuant to this resolve that was filed? Yes, sir. And may I assume you wrote it? Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like, do you have it with you? you have a yes, copy sir. Of it? All right, let's go to page six. And I'd like you to go to the next to the last paragraph, which reads, it is, pr it is critical that the economic development strategy be tied closely to the housing and community development plans of the community, including the consolidated plan of the city. And the reason that's interesting, and I, I have quite a few of these, so we'll go through them as quickly as we can. In a HUD economic development toolkit, HUD writes, it is also critical that the economic development strategy be tied closely to the housing and community development plans of the community, including the consolidated plan. And then they add in, which will be discussed later in this chapter. Now let's go to page 17. And you have innovation slash creative sector development, 2016 forward. And you write, an open innovation creative economy rewards collaboration, transforming how buildings and entire districts are designed and spatially arrayed. Our diverse population demands more and better choices of where to live, work and play, fueling demand for more walkable neighborhoods where housing, jobs, and amenities intermix. And out of a text called The Rise of Innovation Districts, published by the Brookings Institute, they write, 
Our open innovation economy rewards collaboration, transforming how buildings and entire districts are designed and spatially arrayed. Our diverse population demands more and better choices of where to live, work and play, fueling demand for more walkable neighborhoods where housing, jobs and amenities intermix. Now let's go to page 40 at the top. Changing shopping patterns and demographic shifts, this is in the first paragraph, led to a disinvestment in the neighborhood shopping districts from the 1970s through the early years of the 21st century. And from the Boston Main Streets Foundation, we have changing shopping patterns and demographic shifts led to a disinvestment in the neighborhood shopping districts from the 1970s through the 1990s. And on that same page from the Boston Main Streets Foundation, it says, there are places where the city's residents can have their basic shopping needs met as well as social gathering places for dining and shopping. And you have in there, at the bar in paragraph, paragraph five, last sentence, there are places where the city's residents can have their basic shopping needs met as well as social gathering places for dining and shopping. Now let's go to page 41 and you have an organizational structure of the Brockton 21st Century Corporation. And other than steering committee, you have organization, promotion, economic restructuring, and design. And that is taken word for word from the Salem Main Streets Initiative. Organization, promotion, economic restructuring, and design, word for word. Now let's go to page 42 under the Main Street's program manager job description. Is responsible, and this is the uh, fifth bullet point, is responsible for the development, conduct, execution, and documentation of the Main Street's program and related public events within the Main Street's boundaries. And from the Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives, they have he, she will be responsible for the development, conduct, execution, and documentation of the Main Street programs and related public events within the boundaries of the program. The one I really like, though, is on page 47, and it's the uh, fourth paragraph down, and it reads, Brockton is a city of neighborhoods. Each neighborhood has at its core a commercial district with a unique culture and history. These commercial districts are important places of commerce and community. They are home to many immigrant-owned, young entrepreneur-owned, and multi-generation-owned businesses. They are places where the city's residents can have their basic shopping needs met as well as social gathering places for dining and shopping. And from the Boston Main Streets program, Boston is a city of neighborhoods. Each neighborhood has at its core a commercial district with a unique culture and history. These commercial districts are important places of commerce and community. They are home to many immigrant-owned and young entrepreneur-owned businesses. They are places where the city's residents can have their basic shopping needs met, as well as social gathering places for dining and shopping. Page 48, next to the last paragraph. Quality must be emphasized in every aspect of the revival and enhancement program. This applies to all elements of the process, from storefront designs to promotional campaigns to educational programs. And this one comes from the Heritage Canada mm -hmm. Foundation, and it reads, quality must be emphasized in every aspect of the revitalization program. This applies equally to each element of the program, from storefront design to promotional campaigns to educational programs. Page 54. Council, how many more you have? I think your point's well made. Well, you're absolutely right. I think the point is well made. I have more. I have the copies of where these statements came from, where these ideas came from, and you mentioned in, on page two that, and I don't know whether it was aimed at us or past councils, but you felt that the letter that Myron Fuller, former publisher of the Enterprise, wrote that you were concerned the corporation would become a political football. And the only thing I can say to you, sir, is that I'm actually embarrassed because, as you know, I was one of the original incorporators. Twenty-three years ago, that corporation was formed and it was supposed to be composed of the movers and shakers in this community who knew business, who knew economic development, 
and who are going to put their best talents and their money and their efforts behind economic development at a time when Mr. Condon and I were wrestling with keeping the city from bankruptcy. Twenty-three years later, after the corporation took over the Rocks uh, and the Shaw Center and the stadium, the city had to forgive $600,000 in interest. At the same time the corporation was managing the Shaw Center and the Rocks uh, Stadium, one of the Rocks owners, and I'm not sure which one, it may spill over into two, ran up $170,000 in sewer and water charges, which could have easily been monitored. It's a matter of public record. Nothing was done about it. And now we're faced with the fact that, as you mentioned in the paper the other day, the corporation is cash-strapped because there just hasn't been the level of support. And to consider, uh, to, uh, to complain that perhaps it's become a political football ignores the performance that has taken place over 23 years. I, I've said before, and it seems amusing, but it isn't, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I'm not going to ask you to comment tonight. I'm just going to tell you that I'm nobody special. I just happen to have the honor of serving as a counselor at large. The rest of my colleagues, we're nobody special. We're just regular people. But I would hope that if someone comes in and proffers a report as their work product, and they've taken so much from other people's efforts and other people's writings and other people's concepts, that you would disclose that. You would footnote it. You would put in a bibliography. Because it's, it's really inexcusable where I come from. This is not an academic paper. I, I don't sure, fear. It's a question sir, of integrity, sir. sir. It's a question of integrity. Did I, did I get to speak to it? No. Some of that, when you reference the Boston Main Streets program, I was on the board of directors of one of the Boston Main Streets. I, I contributed care. a great deal through that to the overall. So anytime you, you read Boston Main Streets, I could have had a hand in it. I don't know. I've collected stuff for 30 years. There's a lot of things that we do that we pull from authoritative voices. We don't get re I'm not going to rewrite it. It is what they say. It is the answer. Well, then and I'm contribute to them you then. answers, sir. I'm not saying that I wrote every word of this. I said I put it together. And yes, there are parts of this that absolutely I researched it all. I wrote it, and I stand by it. Well, I, for my part, and I'll let my colleagues decide how they handle it, I'm just disappointed. I, I, uh, I think it's another embarrassment for the corporation. Uh, I don't think you've been made a political football. I think there have been abject failures along the way. And quite frankly, I, I would be very suspect of other reports that come in uh, because I'm never going to know if they're genuine or not. And, and with and that, I have nothing else to say. May I answer the question yes, on the statement regarding who serves on the B-21 board? If you look at the list on page 3, you see it is many of the leaders of the community um, in the business and nonprofit sectors. Uh, I stand by the quality of the people that serve. I don't, I'm not going to go through the list right now, but you all have it in front of you. And I stand by those ladies and gentlemen that give a great deal of time and expect nothing in return other than the respect uh, that they deserve for serving. You all done, Councillor? I am. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Sullivan. I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, with all due respect, I have my law degree and my MBA, and so for you to say that something you present uh, is not an academic writing is an insult to those that you presented to. It, it really is. I mean, if, if, you, if you take something that is not your word, we all learn this in, in high school or, or grammar school. You have to give it a reference. So with that being said, I do want to thank my colleague for bringing that to attention because it's, it's just it's the right thing to do. And, and I've served on B-21 two times as president of the council. And Mr. Cruz does it and many of us that serve in that capacity. And there isn't a swipe or a slight with anybody that volunteers their time because all these people volunteered. You're compensated, but most of these people are volunteering their time. So, so you know, it's great to say that it's, it's, it's listed as such, but we, we know that. We appreciate that. But I, I, I do take pause uh, when uh, Mr. Farwell was able to clearly, he spent a lot of time, did a lot of due diligence on that. And for you to just kind of push it aside and say it's not an academic writing. I've been on the council 11 years, and I, I, I take an insult to that, quite honestly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lally. 
Oh, good evening. Um, I just, I just want to add to what my colleagues have said that if, you know, if, if this were something that I had turned in at Bridgewater State, I could very well, I'd, I'd be in deep, deep trouble. Plagiarism is a, is a serious problem. And certainly it, it does undermine the report as a whole if things like this can be pointed out. That being said, I do want to, you know, take this time just to recognize your efforts and the efforts of everyone here. And, you know, I, I do I do respect the you know, your your goals in the improvement of the city of Brockton and, and I recognize that you your organization, the Main Street Manager, Gary Leonard, I recognize that you all do good work for this city. I believe the question here not is whether or not B21 should remain, but whether or not there are some things we can do to make Brockton 21st Century Corporation run a little smoother, maybe a, a little more efficiently. Thank you. Thank you. Council Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, could I have Mr. Jenkins up again, please? Okay, one of the reasons I had mentioned that I was going to file this resolve is because as the Main Street manager in the, in the program, I had mentioned to you some of my frustrations. Yes. And one, one of them highlighted here is one of the proposals is a facade program. Right. And yet we still see these old wrecked signs. Um, one of them I'll highlight is at the Portentous Plaza, there's, you know, it's just this broken sign, just to me, part of the Main Street Manager's a facelift and, and, ch and changing that. So this is why, I guess, had um, something come along like this much sooner, maybe we would not be expressing so much frustration. Uh, in your department and you and your um, we receive reports regularly. They're available to the public. And this was one of the situations where I asked to have someone come up here tonight was to discuss what people were responsible for, what was happening, and as my colleague mentioned earlier, some evaluations. Because we have so many empty storefronts. And this is why I was reluctant to support this whole 40R and other proposal here for the urban, uh, you know, revitalization. I am for urban revitalization. And I know many people, and I respect them, that have been on the committee throughout this whole project. But it just seems that that economic piece is missing. I guess if you looked at it as a report card and you said, how many new businesses have come in? Yes, I realize that's a challenge, or even just a change so that if we walk down the street, we'd know which buildings were for rent, the size, <coughs> how, you know, who could we contact. Or, and I was asked by actually Station Lofts, um, the, the gentleman that uh, is part of Capstone, why didn't we receive any form of welcome to downtown Broughton, this is what's here, whether it's a dry cleaner or, you know, where the churches are located, et cetera. And again, this is not all up to you to do, oh. but this is the impression you get of a Main Street manager or a downtown Broughton manager. And I realize some really great things are going on in Camp Palo, and I fully agree with the definition that they were a much more organized area. I've been coming to these meetings when I was on the other side of uh, this, uh, where I'm sitting now, and I always remember how they wanted to define that area for its antique stores and collectibles, and it was just a shame that that never went forward. As far as some ordinances, I was very excited tonight when that was brought up for cafes, outdoor cafes. And to me, that was my understanding that that effort would be taken to move that forward. And once again, I'm not pointing this at you, but this was what we were looking for and what we believed a Main Street manager was. And I am one of these people that reads, like my um, colleague, um, Win Winter Fowl, uh, what other people are doing, and can we copy it? Is it feasible here? 
and um, if it can work and it can bring more revenue and enhance the downtown because like others um, here tonight, we're very concerned about our schools and we're really um, trying to make an effort to, you know, change the infrastructure and improve it. So this is why we're looking for revenue sources that are positive and enhancing. So thank you. Sure. Um, that's a lot, Ann. <laughs> Let me try to address, if I could keep up, okay. the facade program. Um, the city does have a facade program that was a grant program. Um, it was on a hiatus due to my call for about a year and a half because I went to the mayor's office and my board yeah. to change it from a grant program to a loan program. <coughs> Zero interest, no payments, but if you own the building and you're successful and you're, in most of the cases, leasing the building to a business, we feel that if you refinance your building or if you sell your building, the city should get its money back and we recirculate it. So the facade program, there is a facade program, but it's also a participation. We can't make anyone do facade, okay? We can only have the program and we can incentivize it. We can go and target certain buildings, certain, especially those buildings that stand out. You mentioned the pretentious plaza. Um, when it was a grant, we couldn't even get them to get in the application in a timely fashion. Um, now that it's a loan, yeah, we do target certain buildings. Um, we just actually had our deadline, and I'll let folks know you can come see those applications. Deadline was April 1st. There are two deadlines, April 1st and October 1st. We received five applications for the April 1st. Understanding that it is a loan program and folks, and that a lien will be put on your property, we still got five applications in. Um, in regards to, you also mentioned in, um, I'll get into the 40R, that's later. Um, for people to know what's going on downtown or throughout Brockton, B21 produced a, a guide for all the businesses that are in Brockton pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, Michael. Right. Um, that's available to anybody, or you can, I think it's on your website as well. And it's on the city's website. So it's not necessary, and also understand, mm -hmm. before Michael Gallerani got there, there was no executive director at B21 mm -hmm. for almost two years, which is kind of unheard of for an e economic development organization. No executive director. Um, I don't know how they function. The board is to be commended because that was a long process. And I didn't participate fully in the process, but I was aware of it, just like I'm sure the city council president at that time was aware of it because they serve on that, that board. But to go that long without an executive director, so it's unacceptable. I got to say, it. it's just unacceptable, but that's where we were. Um, but they do produce that guide. I guess my point is that guide is available on the city's website, on their website. You can go to B21 and pick it up. We also do mailings. I send it out to anyone, whoever. Every time we get someone who comes into the city, they say, where's a restaurant to go to? Well, instead of sending them always to the Peruvian, the same place, because HUD comes here and monitors us at least four times a year, audits and everything else, programs, instead of sending them to the Peruvian, I look through the, look through the guide, send them to Georgia's. I can send them to any place that's in there. Usually it's Georgia's or the Peruvian. Those are my favorite places. <laughs> um, in regards to the urban, renew urban renewal district, I think the point was made earlier that we have a plan. Um, the urban renewal district is one of the tools as well as the district improvement financing along with the 40R. And I, I know there was, a, I guess there was a, you could feel a turn in the, I guess, atmosphere when the 40R was mentioned because it, I guess the expansion of the 40R gives some concern. The, the council is in a, a in a is at a point where not only are you the leaders of this community that has a you're going to have to take risk. There's no other way to describe it. It's just like development. You got to take some risk. But the thing is, is that and I hope Rob emphasized this enough. We can't do anything without your approval. If we do a development or the BRA is doing a development and we come in and said this is what we want to do, you can reject it under the urban renewal plan. It's really up to you. If we don't provide you with the information that's provided that you need in order to make a educated a decision on whether or not this is good for the city, you can reject it. 
That's, a, that's the other thing about having, and I just wanted to mention that sure. because I, I didn't know if that was enforced enough. And I know, Ann, you participated in it. I think every single public hearing the BRA had, its Citizen Advisory Committee had, the Planning Board had, and you were, I, we should have hired you. You were at every meeting I was at. Um, Councilor Azak participated in some of those meetings, and I know Shana Barnes was at some of those meetings. I think it's very interesting when I, I look at the, uh, especially B21 as an economic development entity in its activity along with, and I'm going to cut this short because this is well, um, it is past my bedtime. <laughs> 10 o'clock, I'm usually in the bed, guys. Me too. <laughs> All right. Um, the Main Street Manager Program, I know, um, Councilor Farwell, you mentioned those four pillars <coughs> for the Main Street. Um, those are with every Main Street programs. So I would consider that ple plagiarism because without those four, if ever they do go to be um, independent without city resources, they have to have those four pillars and demonstrate that they've been working on those four pillars. Um, that's part of the program. That's part of the National Historic uh, Preservation. That's what they measure you on, how you advance those four pillars. Um, I can't answer all your questions, Anne, because I can only take notes so quickly. Is there right. anything else you want to? Oh uh, no, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. You all set, Councilor? Councilor Farwell. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, not yes, not to belabor the point, but I, I agree you have to take risk. Mm -hmm. But if you take risk, you want it to be an informed risk. And if it's somebody else's money, you definitely want to be well informed. And so if you see some reluctance on the part of the counselors, it's not that we're against economic development or even increasing the housing, housing density. It's all of the unknowns that are facing sure. us now that, that preclude uh, some of us from, from feeling comfortable. And I agree with you about if there are four pillars that are common to every Main Street program, then I would say footnote it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely use it, but footnote it and say, according to the Main Street program, here are the four pillars that are, that are necessary. But I, I'm not going to belabor my objection. I understand. Thank you. Anyone else? And it's in a motion, which has to be a, a motion has to be in the affirmative and then vote against it. So Move to recommend favorably to the full city council. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend the resolves favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? They're sent to the full city council unfavorably. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, Item number 18. We're almost done, people. <laughs> if you could read that, and then we're going to have to postpone that one. Resolved that Michelle Picario, Executive Director of Plymouth 400 and Sheila Fay, Project Coordinator of Plymouth 400, be invited to appear before a committee of the City Council members on Plymouth 400, Massachusetts 1620-2020, an American story, a national legacy. Uh, Ms. Pecoraro contacted us. They were unable to make it tonight. I believe this is Councilor yes, Borgat. Yes, this is my resolve, and I'd, I'd like to ask to table it, please. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded to table this to, the future, to a future date. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is tabled. Item number 21. Resolved that the city's mayor and solicitor come before the finance committee to provide a status update and to discuss reacquiring the real property located at 226 Main Street, commonly known as the Gainley Building, that was conveyed by the city for nominal consideration for the, to the Commonwealth for purpose of using the property as a college collaborative. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, yeah. Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor. Mr. Chairman, Council Sullivan. I'm going to make a motion to postpone. Uh, I did speak to uh, Attorney Nazarella. There is no status update. Nothing's changed since uh, the mayor came before us. Uh, DCAM is still uh, analyzing certain things. So I'm going to make a motion to postpone until the first FinCom in May. Second. second. Okay. Motion made and seconded to postpone until the first FinCom in May. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, postponed. Uh, item number 22. Resolved that Massasoit Community College President Charlie Wall be invited to come before the Finance Committee to discuss options to bring the Massasoit yeah. Allied Health and Sciences Building back to its originally proposed location in downtown Brockton. Invited Charlie Wall, President. Uh, Councilors, I received a letter from uh, Dr. Wall earlier today uh, stating that he would be unable to make it tonight, that he uh, is interested in the issue. Uh, in a broad way, and he'd be interested in hosting a meeting with the council at uh, a forum at the uh, college at some point uh, 
So, uh, Council Monahan, did you want to table this? Or? I'm going to make a motion to postpone. I'm going to keep on to the next Just so you know, he, his letter is yeah, very well, clear. We'll he keep won't asking be coming. Him, uh, maybe in the meantime, we'll talk to him about it. Okay. I have a call in to him, too. He uh, was very clear he won't be coming. But All right. We'll, then, we'll most table. make a motion to table. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to table. Item, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> Item is tabled. Mr. Chairman, I can't believe anybody wants to, but <laughs> a moment of personal privilege. <laughs> oh, shoot her now. I have to thank everybody that came out last Saturday for Keep Brockton Beautiful. We had a bunch of volunteers. It um, gets better and better every year. Thank you to my colleagues that actually went out and cleaned up. Councilor Sullivan, who came out with his um, the Young Sullivans, and <laughs> Councilor Beauregard, who were out cleaning, um, helping Keep Brockton Beautiful. Oh, no, thank you, you Councilor Lally, who came and helped me with the raffles. So um, I look forward to next year, but I hope everybody will uh, continue keeping Brockton beautiful every day by cleaning up just in front of our own home. Okay. And uh, my second moment of personal privilege is I'd okay. like to wish my oldest daughter, Alexandra, a happy birthday. Her birthday's tomorrow, and she turns 15. Oh, wow. Well, happy Yay. birthday to her. Anyone else? We're adjourned.